ask you to confirm that you're present. Once you've done this, the meeting will commence. And I start with Councillor Bass. Present. And apologies, I've, I've started on the wrong foot because I'm out of um, alphabetical order. So that was Councillor Abbas, wasn't it, I believe? Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, my bad. Indeed, sorry. You were, you were correct, Councillor. Um, Councillor Abraham. Uh, I'm present. Councillor Archer. Present. Councillor Aurora. Present. Councillor Bailey. Present. Councillor Bass. Councillor Bass. Do we have Councillor Bass in the meeting? Okay, Councillor Bayman. Hello, everyone. Councillor Fiona Bolt. Good evening, I'm present. Councillor Olivia Bolt. Present. Councillor Cobbett. Good evening. Councillor Cunningham. Present. Councillor Daly. Present. Davis. Councillor Davis. Here. Thank you. Councillor Dunstan. Good evening. Councillor Durant. Good evening. Councillor Edwards. Uh, good evening, everybody. Councillor Foley Hughes. Good evening. Councillor Fran. Good evening, all. Councillor Gander. Councillor Gander. Do we have Councillor Gander in the meeting? Okay, Councillor George. Good evening, all. Councillor Goodship. Good evening. Councillor Green. Councillor Green. She was at the meeting, she did join. Councillor Hart. Good evening. Councillor Heap. Good evening. Councillor Holt. Good evening. Councillor Hughes. Good evening and present. Councillor Kerr. Good evening. Councillor Kirsch. Good evening. Councillor Lindbetter. Good evening. Councillor Moll. Good evening. I believe we have apologies for lateness from Councillor Netley. I am now. I, good evening. I have now joined. Thank you, thank you Councillor. Councillor Rivalia. Councillor Rivalia. Councillor Ryder Mills. Good evening, Gary. Councillor Shaper. Yes, good evening. Councillor Self. Good, good evening, everybody. Councillor Shepherd. Good evening, everybody. Councillor Stewart. Good evening. Councillor Fashko Sona. Here. Councillor Sweeney. Good evening. Councillor Tyler. Good evening. Councillor Thompson. Good evening. Councillor Tommy. Evening. Councillor Waring. Hello, everybody. Councillor White. Good evening. Councillor Wookie. Good evening. Councillor Yoga Nathan. Good evening. Councillor Young. Good evening, everyone. Can I just try again in respect of Councillor Bass? Do we have Councillor Bass here? Yeah. yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gander. Good evening. Thank you. Councillor Green? Yes, my internet is back. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rebellion? Okay. Um, in case we don't have Councillor Rebellion at present, um, otherwise, I think we have a full house. Um, Madam Mayor, that completes the roll call, and you must start the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Marston. Um, I'm now, now I'd like to ask Reverend Luke Wiggy of St Paul's Church Hook to lead us in prayer and reflection on a sad death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and I would ask that members of choir to respect for the excuse. Thank you. Reverend Wiggins.
Is Robert Wickings in the meeting, please? Robert Wickings, are you here? Reverend Wickings appears not to be here. Can I please ask for a minute's silence in memory of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, please? Thank you. We will now turn to the formal business of the meeting. Item one on our agenda for tonight's apologies. Are there any apologies for absence, please, Mr. Marston? Madam Mayor, we have not received any apologies for absence tonight. Thank you, there are no apologies. Declarations of interest. Under item two on the agenda, do any members wish to be inventors of any interest they may need to declare on items to pay later on the agenda? If so, please type in your name in the chat function and I will then call you to speak. Councillor Dunstan, please, who could that you wish to speak. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, sorry. Um, as one of the Council's representatives on the JV Company, although I do not consider I have any conflict of interest, out of an abundance of caution and in the interest of transparency, I will withdraw from the debate on item 11 regarding the Cambridge Road Estate Programme delivery. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Dunstan. Councillor Edwards, you always wish to, you also wish to speak. Um, thank you, Mayor. I'm in the same position as Councillor Dunstan. Thank you very much indeed. That is noted. Um, we will therefore move to the next item. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Under item three on the agenda, may I sign the minutes of the meeting of the Council held on the 25th of February 2021 as a true record, please? Does any member have any objection to agreeing these as an accurate record? And if you do, please could you indicate your objection in the chat function? There are no objections, I will sign those later. Thank you. Fourth item is Mayor's announcements. I have a few announcements. Firstly, I would like to congratulate two housing officers, Jacqueline Farrier and Jane Mallard, who have been nominated for a commendation from the Metropolitan Police BCU commander for their dedication and professionalism in ensuring the safety of the residents of the borough, as well as their enthusiasm for partnership working with the police, and particularly for their work on the Cambridge Road estate. Jackie and Jane have worked tirelessly to safeguard the most vulnerable <coughs> and improve the lives of all the residents on the estate building up outstanding levels of trust and confidence within the community. And I am delighted that they have received this well-deserved commendation and recognition. And I'm sure we all feel the same, which is excellent. As you will all be aware, it was sadly necessary to cancel the Mayor's Ball for the second time, which had been provisionally scheduled to take place on 23rd of April. But nonetheless, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all of you who have agreed to, to donate the value of your ticket to the Mayor's Charitable Fund. If anybody would still like to contribute to the non-ball, please feel free to do so, um, because all the money would of course go to the Mayor's Charitable Fund. Finally, there is a reminder about the mobile mop-up project, which we've been running in the borough in partnership with Genuine Solutions. We have three weeks to go. If you could all please possibly ask all your friends, relatives, any societies, organisations you belong to, 
anyone at all, if they have any unused, unwanted, not unused, any phones they are not using at the moment, any unwanted mobile phones, so that they can be reused or the parts recycled, they will go to the Mayor's Charitable Trust and we will continue to benefit from any proceeds raised. So if, like many of us, you have any, any unwanted mobiles around your home, we will be absolutely delighted to receive them. Thank you very much. I've also got one other um, announcement today, which is not the usual. As you all know, we will have to be holding a very different mayor making and annual council this year. And one of the unforeseen consequences of this is that I will not be able to make the customary retiring mayor's speech to all members. Now, I do realise that most people would not regard this as being an entrepreneurial problem, but I do want to say a few things so that they are on record. To state the obvious, this has been an extremely challenging year for us all. We have all faced serious difficulty and sadness in our personal and what is in our council lives. And I would like to say a heartfelt thank you to every member who has done their best to make the past 14 months of remote council meetings work, who has cooperated with the sometimes difficult methods of managing the process, and who has made it possible for me to chair the meetings despite the glitches. Together, we have continued the business of council for the good of our residents, we have made decisions, we have engaged in debates that are generally courteous and constructive, and I think we can be proud of what we have all achieved, so thank you very much indeed everybody for this. Of course, none of this would have been possible without Gary Marston, Sam Nichols, Fiona Cotter and the rest of the Democratic Services team. Gary especially has worked closely with me to ensure these meetings run as smoothly as possible, with great tact and patience, often much needed. The whole IT team has been innovative, creative, and again, like Gary, very calm and patient with my technical incompetence. So thank you very much indeed. There are a few names I would like to highlight. Councils Ravalia and um, Abraham, of whom more later, have been my deputies for the last two years, and thank you for all your hard work. Councils Archer and Young, my fellow ward councillors, have been supportive and helpful, especially with case work. The previous mayors who are here, councillors Aurora, Cunningham, Tyler, and Jonathan, have all been generous with their time and their advice and stepping in where necessary. The leaders of both parties, um, councillors Davis and Kerr, have also been supportive and helpful. I will speak more about Brian and Sullivan and Alison Croucher later, but they are two of the best people at their jobs I have worked with anywhere. There's one other thank you. Nobody has ever called me a domestic goddess. Nobody is ever likely to. But the person who deserves the most thanks from me is probably picking up the slack in that respect as I speak now. My dear husband and consort, Richard, has been an absolute pillar of strength, carrying my belongings, keeping me calm, making sure that my daily quota of cups of tea is met, and that is absolutely crucial. Without my tea, I cannot function. He's never minded the domestic chaos. Um, he sorted out my problems and he's given his timeless energy to support me and generally it being just wonderful. You probably can't hear this, but it would have been twice as hard work and half as much fun without it. So I do want to put that on record. Thank you. So thank you again, everybody. Um, it has been, as I say, a very challenging time, but I feel we have worked together and we have done the best we can under the circumstances. So thank you. We will now continue with the rest of the agenda. Um, uh, um, Sorry? Uh, oh, Councillor Davis, you wish to speak? Yes, Madam I, I had put the uh, request in the chat and I wasn't aware that you were going to make the speech you just did, um, but thank you very much. My, my intention of putting it in the chat was that this is, of course, your last meeting as mayor. And um, I almost wish it could go on for another year in a, in, a, in a sense, because the opportunity to complete a proper year as mayor would have been fitting. And although you've done a tremendous job uh, chairing this council through some very torrid meetings and difficult times over the internet, um, obviously the mayor also performs a ceremonial role. And I, all I would say is that um, I, it, it's, it is, it's a shame that you've not been able to fulfil what I had hoped two years ago was going to be an extraordinary mayoral year, um, full of um, community impact and fundraising and some real fun for you in the community. I just hope you've enjoyed your time 
um, and I'm just saddened that you can't complete it, but certainly on behalf of the opposition, we send you very, very good wishes and our grateful thanks for all you've done. Thank you very much, Dean Councillor Lewis. That's extraordinarily kind of you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kerr, you wish to say something? I do. Um, I just wanted to say a few words as well, um, Madam Mayor. I know it's a breach of protocol to be be speaking at this meeting rather than at annual council but we know that very few people will be attending this year so if there was ever a case of come the hour come off the woman it was margaret with covid she'd already done a successful year as mayor much love universally respected for her integrity her kindness her intelligence and her empathy most mayors tell you that it's one of the most exhausting roles that they've ever undertaken but just as Margaret should have been putting her feet up, she was asked to do the whole thing again. And being Margaret, she said yes. I have had the honour and the pleasure of working alongside her in my first year as leader. Sadly, I have to say, we mostly only met at funerals, but it has been a comfort to know that at the end of the phone, she was always there as a supportive and wise voice. And I have always marvelled not just at her wisdom, but her sense of duty and also her stoicism, because she has performed her role serenely, often battling pain and health problems. And some of you may be unaware of the real hardships she's gone through, having to wear red, which she feels doesn't suit her, having to have her photograph taken constantly, which she absolutely detests, or having to teach the borough to dance, despite her belief that this particular performance art is not one of her core strengths. One of the reasons that Margaret made such a great mayor is that it was never about her. She does always seem to be thinking about other people. I watched her distribute the Mayor's Award last week. I know it was a pretty gruelling schedule going from one ceremony to another, hour after hour, for several days. But her pleasure in honouring the work in our communities shone through, and it warmed the hearts of everyone in the virtual meal room that I attended. She always goes the extra mile, in some cases, literally. Her fundraising has stretched to travelling around the borough for two years now, collecting old mobile phones. I know she's just made her final appeal. And she was always true to herself, even if her refusal to use a rude word in the chamber almost sparked a constitutional crisis. In all circumstances, you could rely on her to be fair-minded and altruistic, whilst also being self-deprecating, funny and good company. In short, Margaret has been an exemplary mayor and a memorable one. We will miss you. In particular, we will miss Gary Marson's serial intervention at all full councils. You were on mute, Madam Mayor. You will go down in the annals of history as, I believe, the only person in the Royal Borough of Kingston ever to be mayor for two consecutive years. However, the contribution which those of us who've witnessed your period of office firsthand will take with us to the grave will be your VE Day dance routine which will be etched in our memories for a lifetime. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for going above and beyond. Thank you for serving the borough so well and for entertaining us at the same time. Because it is just I can't think why anybody thought it would be a good idea. So thank you very much indeed. Okay, I, I gather the first part of it was on you, so I just say thank you very much indeed for those very kind words. And I um, don't know how to continue the meeting after that, really. But thank you so much. It's very, very much appreciated. And if anybody wants to spend five minutes, they'd like to watch something really, really funny, watch the dancing there, it really, um, you will never forget it. Now we now move on to item six, public questions. Sorry. Um, we did not receive notice by the deadline of any new petitions for submission at this meeting, so we have no petitions. Public questions. We allow up to 30 minutes at the start of each ordinary meeting of council for questions from the public. We have received two questions this evening. 
please remember that only one supplementary is allowed and it must arise directly from the original question or response for clarification and it cannot be a statement. The first question is from Frank Suna on behalf of the Children and Care Council. So Frank, welcome to the meeting. Would you like to ask your question to Councillor White, please? Thanks very much. Um, my name is Frank Suna and I'm here on behalf of the Children in Care Council. And the question the Children in Care Council wanted to ask the Mayor is, COVID has been clearly, you know, had on young people and it has greatly impacted young people everywhere around our local area. And the young people want to know, what does the council have in place coming out of lockdown? And what is the plan post lockdown? Clearly, COVID has had impact on young people in terms of working opportunities, mental health, and their physical health. So young people everywhere want to know what the council has got planned post lockdown and coming out of lockdown. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Shall I respond? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can we just explain some technical problems this evening? One of the problems is that it's taking a little while for the mute in this room to come on and off. So I have started sentences while I'm still on mute. For that, I apologise, but I have no way of telling. So, Councillor White, would you like to respond to Frank uh, Sino, please? Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. And thank, you, and thank you very much, Frank, for coming along tonight. And um, please thank the Children in Care Council there for their involvement. As a council, as you know, we've worked incredibly hard with our children's services, a team and our other partners to ensure that young people and their families are supported during the pandemic, mostly through our Kingston Stronger Together Hub. And through this hub, additional support has been offered to young people who, for example, have been shielding due to health concerns, experiencing financial hardship, food insecurity or mental health challenges. Coming into the recovery phase, the recovery phase we have set up um, two task forces to look at the impact and support needed for all residents, including our children and young people. We have the economic, economic recovery task force, which has a focus on helping more young people to get back into employment, including the Kickstart scheme, I hope that everyone's heard about, which is providing more apprenticeship opportunities for young people aged 16 to 24. We also have the Communities Task Force, which has a particular focus on supporting young people's health and mental health, and on supporting those who are experiencing poverty. Alongside this, through the Corporate Parenting Panel, we are looking at a, a leisure and culture programme for children in care and care leavers, which would include access to physical activities. And I would really like to bring these initial thoughts to the Children in Care Council um, for everyone to develop, if, that's, if I may. I know our children's services are working extremely hard to support all our young people post lockdown. And we're very grateful to the Children in Care Council and the Youth Council for playing an important role in developing the support and also deciding how we use our resources most successfully. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much, Councillor. Right and we will feed back to the Children in Care Council. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we also have a question from, um, so thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Um, you may now leave the virtual meeting, but you're welcome to follow the rest of it on the Council's YouTube stream if you would like to do so. Um, we now have a question from Ms. Maria Grant Gali to Councillor Cobbett. So Ms. Gali, would you like to ask your question please? Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much. My name is Maria Grazia Zingale. So, dear councillors, the deadlines for EU citizens to apply for sexual status is the 30th of June 2021. Non-British EU citizens only have until the 30th of June this year to apply to the EU settlement scheme and receive either pre status limited leave to remain in the UK for five years 
or settled status indefinitely leave to remain in the UK. The challenge we have in the UK is that there is no accurate estimate of the EU migrant population. The pandemic has also meant that many of the organizations who have supported EU citizens at risk, such as the homeless or those with the limited digital and English language skills, are limited in capacity and the type of, of the outreach they can do. Additionally, some EU citizens are working roles where they have no formal contact with employers or HR resources to tell them about the new rules, such as self-employed tradesmen workers. The consequences of not applying is very clear from the legal point of view. Those EU citizens who do not make a successful application by the 30th of June 2021 will become unlawfully resident in the UK and therefore can lose their jobs, rented properties and access to services. The Home Office has published guidance for late applications on reasonable grounds. However, many who do apply late will need expert support to provide evidence and make their case. On a positive note, the UK government has confirmed that EU citizens will still have the right to vote in local elections. However, it is not clear if the EU nationals will retain this right in future due to the government policy of seeking bilateral agreements with each EU member state. There are EU citizens in the Royal Bar of Kingston according to the electoral roll, but there may be others living in less formal circumstances, such sublets, houses in multiple occupation or agricultural accommodation. Therefore, my question is, will the Council take urgent steps from now until the end of June to remind everyone of the EU settlement scheme application deadlines and reach out to EU citizen communities in the Royal Borough of Kingston, in particular, those at risk of being left out of mainstream channels of communication, and also to British residents like employers and landlords who will need to be familiar with how EU citizens will have to prove their status after the 30th of June 2021. What support will the Council ensure to citizens who miss the deadline and need to make late applications based on the published Home Office guidance? And finally, will the, question, will the Council advocate for the EU citizens to, to have their voting rights preserved regardless of their nationalities? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Corbett, would you like to respond please? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria, for your for your question. You raised a really important uh, topic this evening. Um, I mean, the simple answer to, to whether we'll be using our resources to do everything that we can uh, between now and the 30th of June to, to, to remind everyone who may not have already applied for their settled status uh, before 30th of June to, to, to do so is, is yes, we will. But I think probably you've raised a lot in your questions and really deserves a little bit more information than, than that. Um, I mean, I should start by saying that, uh, you know, I, I regret that we're in this uh, this situation. I would much yeah. rather that our EU citizens continue to enjoy the rights that they always enjoyed and that I was going to enjoy the uh, the rights I was expecting uh, in the other direction. But we're, I'm not going to relitigate that debate again uh, tonight, but I think that is worth, worth saying. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about some of what we have been doing. I think this is an area where, you know, whatever you do, you feel you could always, uh, there's always more you could do, but there are a range of things we've been doing to, to try and encourage people to apply. Uh, we included a reminder in the annual uh, council tax statement that goes out to every home. Uh, we've been including reminders in our business newsletter. Uh, we have been using sort of paid for social media advertising, particularly uh, using a, a, a variety of languages for, for those who might not have English as their first language. Uh, we have been promoting through our residents newsletter, which now reaches over 6,000 residents. We've been sharing through our, our different social media channels that the, that the council has but also very much picking up the point you made around uh, business and employment. We've been working closely with Kingston Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, to help them then provide the support for eligible employees and uh, everything that flows through that about people's work status. We've also been uh, taking uh, a partnership approach, working with our schools to reach uh, to reach families that way. Um, and clearly, as, as you said, you know, the, the election, you know, was an opportunity and we've tried to, you know, 
remind people that they can vote in the, these elections. Obviously, the registration for that is closed now, uh, but recognise that it can be confusing with different eligibility and different kinds of elections. So we try to get that message out there. But the wider work around uh, trying to register, trying to encourage everyone to register. Uh, is ongoing and will be ongoing right up to the deadline. You're quite right about the point you make about the data. That has been a real issue that we don't have that reliable data source. So the estimate figure that we did have for how many EU citizens we were trying to reach, we've already exceeded that figure in the number that have applied. Now, it, it's great that that many people have applied, but it means that we, we actually don't know how many more people that there are to reach. In my sense, is we've kind of reached the people that you can find easily. Uh, and now we're we're into maybe the more difficult cases where more support is needed, and we're, we're focusing our support on that. As in terms of your question about whether you know whether we'd be happy to to, to sort of lobby, uh, you know, government and the powers that be that EU citizens should continue to enjoy the right to vote. I mean, I'm I'm certainly very supportive of, of, of that and would do what we can. I'm sure many of my colleagues would. I can't guarantee you uh, that those lobbying efforts will be successful, uh, but certainly willing to, uh, to to try on that front. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will obviously feedback and I hope hope everything goes well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, do you have a, sup a, supplementary, a supplementary question, please, Mrs. Dolly? No, no. I think that that was uh, was fine. I understand. I also understand that uh, a couple of the points I made, that they require extra extra information because some of them especially with the with home office recent they recently published published that they the, for those who meet the deadline uh, they um, they can apply late on reasonable grounds but it's not clear what the reasonable grounds are so i'm sure some some of those citizens who apply may need some support so and, understandably there is a question but obviously i hope that we can get something in future for, for that. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, if you would like to continue to watch the um, watch this on the council's YouTube link, you're very welcome, but you may leave the live meeting now if you wish. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you. We now turn to item seven, the motion uh, proposed by the Conservative Group. So I understand that Councillor Davis moved the motion, is that correct, Councillor Davis? That's correct. Thank you. And that's Councillor Cunningham, you will be seconding. Yeah, so I will second and uh, reserve my right to speak later. Okay, thank you. Um, I've received requests to speak as well from Councillor Kerr and Councillor Bass. If there are any other um, members not already named who wish to speak, please could you indicate by typing your name in the chat function now? <clears throat> thank you. So, <coughs> Councillor uh, Lidbetta and Sumner so far. Thank you. Um, Councillor James, would you uh, move the motion, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this isn't a particularly uh, contentious motion. I mean, that we have clearly faced um, the most extraordinary year in the lives of any of us on this council um, and um, there are many things of hope that we've all learned um, about ourselves our families our neighbors and, and many others and one of those that struck me is this very very huge desire and urge around public health which in a way would never have happened i don't think without the pandemic and I'm an optimist and always look for positive things from uh, negative times. And I'm hoping that uh, this will create um, across the country a, a new understanding around our own health and what we do and don't do um, to try and extend our lives, to leave a full alive and to do the things that are, are really important. And I think it's fair to say, as, if, as this, as this um, motion has acknowledged, that um, we actually have an incredibly good record, not surprisingly in Kingston, because it is a relatively wealthy part, borough, a wealthy part of London, and you'd expect life expectancy and those sorts of um, measures to be very, very uh, good measures. Um, you, but as with any borough in London, um, even the wealthy boroughs, there are hidden pockets um, that we need to tackle and we need to do something about. 
Um, and I'm hoping that all members on the council will agree that um, we have a role, not just our public health role, which is obviously vital. Um, we obviously have the health and wellbeing hall, which contributes enormously to the public health agenda. But I think all of us as members of the council, all 48 of us, ought to be paying more attention to what happens in the area of health and wellbeing. Um, in my time chairing the health and wellbeing board, I've often found it not to be the best way to um, run public health in the country, in this particular borough. Um, it's, ha it's had its ups and downs. It's very difficult to manage such a wide number of people when trying to create a positive environment for public health. So what this is asking us to do, this is the background I've given to you, but what it's asking us to do is to do, to do more. There, there is the opportunity to increase the amount of usage of our parks um, with uh, the use of public gyms, which we've, we have installed in some parks and some places, but I think we need to go further with that and to examine whether there's another opportunity to help people's fitness and um, health through those sorts of things. There's the very urgent requirement that we do something about our parks. I mean, we're very lucky to have both uh, Richmond Park, Home Park, and all of our own public spaces that we have within the borough as well, um, that are fully accessible to people to use for public exercise. Um, and given what we've seen as a borough, with the very large numbers of people on our own riverside, on the Queen's Promenade, who have been taken to walking in Bushy Park and Home Park and all those other parks as well. One minute. Thank you. It's clear that we need to do more to help the Royal Parks Agency. And it seems to me that some of the changes they bring about don't necessarily address the needs of the residents of this borough. But I also think there's some more that we need to do around the Kingfisher swimming pool. We need to be have absolute certainty and commitment that by the end of 2023, by quarter three, as we promised, that we deliver that. And we should be doing all that we can to do it. And I'm afraid on our side, we don't believe the current programme that's being predicted gives us that certainty. Even when it does come forward, we can't see how um, such a large scheme will net out what we need to do. And as I said at the beginning, I think it's really important that we, all 48 of us, take now have an interest in this particular area and that we need reports coming back to us as a full council, not just to the very small number of us who sit on the Health and Wellbeing Board, but actually we as a council monitor what's going on here and what improvements we can make as a borough and as a council to the well-being of everybody that lives here. Very much, Councillor Davis. Um, Councillor Kerr, I think you're next to speak, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to table an amendment. Is that seconded, please? I, I will second it. It's Councillor Sweeney. Thank you, Councillor Sweeney. So, um, proposed by Councillor Kerr and seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Um, have all members received the amendment? No, Madam, I haven't seen it. Will be, um, will be emailed the amendment now. And when you have received the email, I will then call an adjournment so that. Um, you can read it properly. So, um, so I'll give another couple of minutes to ensure that all members have received the email. Could somebody indicate to me, please, that when you have received it, so that I know that people have received it? Just indicate by raising your hand and um it has gone out to everybody. So people have started to receive it now. I will now um, call for an adjournment. It's now 10 past 8, so we will re reconvene at 5 and 20 past 8. So that's 16 minutes from now. Thank you. I think, Madam Mayor, before we adjourn, have the public been sent the amendment? Can they see the amendment to the motion? I beg your pardon? Can the members of the public see yeah. the amendment to the motion? It's on the web. It's on the web now because obviously last time we had a problem where people were trying to follow the council meeting 
but couldn't see the amendment. Um, we were all seeing receiving messages from residents saying, we don't know what you're talking about, we can't see the amendment. Um, it's definitely on the web. On, on the council website, can you confirm the website address? Yes, they should be able to find it on the council website, yes, yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, we will adjourn now for 15 uh, until 5 20 past 8. Thank you.
idea. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As, as everybody knows on the council, I am dyslexic and as I, you know, I do have that as a disability. And my point of order is I find it very difficult to read amendments when they're not actually correct. And I would like the Liberal Democrats to take it away and actually look at it and make the, put the amendments and then bring it back to us. If you refer to your to the amendment, for example, you have delete old point 14, present a report to the autumn 2021 meeting of the People's Committee established what further provision of public exercise equipment can be made to our publicly owned housing estates. Now, I'm sorry, point 14 of the old point 14 of the motion does not say that. And so I do not see how this amendment, bear in mind it is exactly incorrect, can actually stand. And I would ask that if people are going to do things which involve deleting points and reordering, is that actually we put it in an order which is accessible to everyone? There are lots of residents who also have disabilities related to reading and writing, and I think it's really unfair. So can I, could, is it possible to get that clarified in writing, please? I'm sure we can do that after this meeting, but uh, um, are all other members content that they have read and they think they understand the meaning of the amendment? I would just like to uh, get on the members clarification, please. Excuse me, but Madam Merrick, it's factually incorrect. The amendment is factually incorrect. That's just a point of law, isn't it? Madam Mayor? Sorry, uh, Councillor Bass wishes to speak, but I'm on mute. Yeah. yeah, no, I just, I mean, obviously, we're, you know, like ever, we're going to have to go ahead with it. But I mean, I might not be diagnosed as dyslexic. I come from a load of a family of dyslexic people. And I can't just assimilate this sort of stuff really quickly. I don't really see why this has to be just presented on the night. They could have had the courtesy to give it ahead of time. Um, and, you know, the fact is, you know, I'm not going to have it on record that I'm happy with it. We'll just have to go with it. Madam Mayor, I don't, I don't have dyslexia, but it is, it is actually, uh, Councillor Summer, I don't always agree with it, it's actually right. Uh, delete old point 13 and 14. Old point 13 and 14 don't say the things that this amendment seems to be saying. So I don't quite. Understand where we are. I mean, I, I mean, I'm old point 12 and 13 says those things. Does that mean the numbering is then incorrect for the rest of it? Yeah. Thank you. It's obviously um, very important that we get this right. So I just uh, confer with Ms. Marston for a few moments. Would it help if we had a slightly longer adjournment, or uh, will that not help? Madam Mayor, as I'm the person with the disability here, um, I, I do think it's important as a council that we actually do realize that some people have, have disabilities and dyslexia is a disability. And if I'm not presented with the correct information and then asked to, to renumber things in my own head, then it's not being presented to me in the correct format. I do not think that is fair. And I do not think that, that actually meets the council's policies on, on equalities. Um, and so what I would like, if that's possible, I'm sure it isn't a long job, is for the Liberal Democrats to take it away and actually correct it and then present it to us so we can we can read it in a proper format. I just feel that you know we do have a policy of inclusion and and equality and, and, and actually following equality's pra best practice. And I do feel on this occasion that the council has fallen short of their obligation here. Um, and it's quite embarrassing for me to have to say this, but um, you know, there will be lots of residents that are in a similar situation. So I'm prepared to take the embarrassment of admitting that I am dyslexic and I have trouble reading things, particularly when they're so incorrect and flawed. 
Okay, well, thank you for that. I mean, clearly we want to get this right, but Mr. Marson um, recommends that we do proceed um, and that we discuss this and that uh, if the numbering is is such a problem, and I'm not sure because I, I've only seen it much the same time as you have, that, um, we, that we ask for clarification. I think that's probably the best way forward. Madam Mayor, I don't want to say belong this, but we do need clarification because as it stands at the moment, the Liberal Democrats are deleting the line, the paragraph that talks about the replacement of the Kingfisher Swoon. I mean, I, I don't know whether they want to delete that. I, I presume they do want to rebuild the Kingfisher Swimming Pool. Well, yes. Councillor Kerr, would you like to comment, please? Because I'm um, equally out of my depth. I'm very happy if there's a problem with the numbering if that's if that's the issue and people are finding it incomprehensible because the numbering is apparently incorrect i'm very happy that we adjourn for another 10 minutes and and, and look at the numbering and then come back but i mean we don't want people not to understand what they're debating and if they've got difficulties then i'm very happy to have another 10 minutes and we'll just check the numbering Madam Mayor, as, as the person with a disability i actually need that in writing as in i need to have those numbers written down and also I need the mistakes correcting, for example, where it says about deleting old item 14, but the old the delete doesn't actually match what's in the motion. So I actually need that in writing. And I think and, and if that can't, if we cannot allow people with disabilities on the council's committee to, to have accurate information, then I'm afraid I will have to make a complaint again that again about that on, on the council's equalities. I'm sorry if you find this difficult. We will do our best to rectify it. We will now adjourn for 10 minutes. 10 further minutes. It's now almost time to now. I suggest we reconvene at quarter to nine, which gives us 16 minutes. Thank you, councillors.
Thank you. Now, because um, this is the plan now is that the amendment will be renumbered and reissued to everybody um, in order to ensure that we are all looking at right numbers at right places. That will happen during the next item on the agenda. So you will receive the email during the next item. Because to save time, we are now going to go to item eight, amend the questions, and then return to the amendment after that. Because otherwise, this is going to take quite a long time. Before we do that, I think Councillor Lynn Betty, you have a point of order. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's, it's just a small point. Um, Councillor uh, Falchikov Sumner referred to in the chat function to our pre election period using another term, which I, I would ask everyone that we don't use any longer because it's part of our, um, shall we say, colonial past. So um, may I ask all councillors to use the term pre election period uh, on, on equality grounds? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Betty. Yes, we do. We do mark that. Councillor Cunningham, you also have wish to raise a point. Councillor Cunningham. Uh, sorry, I was um, the point I was going to make was on the amendment. Uh, uh, so I'll have to wait until you get back to that. Is that I, I can... Yes, thank you, Councillor Cunningham. We're going to have the questions and then come back to the renumbered amendment, which you will be able to see. Thank you. Excuse me, Madam Mayor, can I have a point of personal explanation, please? Is Council led better trying to, in, trying to infer that I'm racist? Because I think that is really, really unfair and that should be withdrawn. The term that she says is offensive is, is one which is in public, in public government documents. And any inference that I'm in any way racist is actually insulting. And I'd like an apology. Council did not suggest that you were racist. She asked that we Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, following the tragic murder of Sarah Everard and the outpouring of public grief, it is really important that women and girls feel safe on our streets. What is the Council already doing, particularly on reporting of incidents and access to support services, and what will we do in the future to work with our partners to engage and ensure this issue is given the highest priority? Thank you, Councillor Corbett. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and I thank Council I hope for the question. I, you know, I think um, all, all members, and I'm sure everyone watching, will have been um, really affected and, and, and shocked by what happened um, uh, with with um, Sarah, Sarah Everard and and, and uh, her murder. And uh, but the reality is, the sad reality is that we may have been talking about it more as a society recently. Uh, but this has been a long-standing problem and it's, you know, there are many cases that you, you wouldn't see on the news that are happening you know, up and down the country week in, week out. And in terms of what, what the council uh, can do, there, there's quite a lot we can do. I'll, I'll try and uh, summarise some of the work we're already doing that, that we can take further. A lot of it is done in partnership with other agencies through, through the Safer Kingston Partnership. Uh, part of that work is around uh, the up, up, upskilling and, and training that we do uh, of all the different agencies involved so people can, can spot potential harm and, and, and risk and, and mitigate that risk. But there's also the very practical work we do in terms of um, uh, placing people, people who may be at risk of, of domestic violence or um, gender-based violence in, uh, in, in, in refugees when, that, when that's necessary and, and supporting that transition. We also work very closely with the police around the reporting because for many women, they'll be in a, a situation at home where it, it isn't actually easy to to make the make the report because the, the perpetrator is is at home with them. So we try and set up uh, places where uh, it will be safe to to make that report because that's often a very important first stage to actually move on to being able to access support. Uh, we're also involved. Uh, 
in, in the in the cases where tragically there is a domestic homicide, where we'll, we'll, we'll work very, that team works very closely with the police uh, after the event in terms of lessons learned. Um, of course, we'd all we'd all rather live in a in a society where the where this didn't happen. Uh, so as much as we do do a lot of work on on support, and rightly so, uh, clearly uh, in the future there's a lot of long term work to do, which is around how we actually have the conversation. Uh, about why this happened, the multifaceted reasons why this happens in the first place, and actually try and um, prevent uh, the situation where people are perpetrators and, and, and therefore are victims. But there is a lot uh, already going on in terms of the, the safeguarding, the support, uh, and the provision of, of refuges and, and, and transition support after that. Adamir, can I come, come back? They have a brief supplementary, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to thank Councillor Corbett for that very comprehensive um, answer to, to my question. And it's reassuring to know that all of these things are going on in, in our borough. Um, but I just wanted to ask if you could take forward um, pursuing the, the um, accreditation of the borough for um, the white ribbon um, accreditation and, and all that entails. Uh, thank you uh, for the supplementary question. So just for just for those who might not be aware that are that are following the proceedings, the the, the white ribbon accreditation is around organisations seeking um, uh, to work with with partners and to get external kind of accreditation for the work that we're doing in this area. So it improves. Uh, it includes some targets around improving. Uh, you know the experience for, for residents and service users it includes um, uh, also being an employer of choice uh, for people that uh, may have suffered um, from gender-based violence or domestic violence uh, and it, it, including support for our staff so we've recently set up a, a, a domestic abuse hotline particularly for our, our, our staff as, as part of this work um, uh, and you kind of get sort of measured against uh, your, your commitments and what you're doing in terms of working with your communities uh, to try and end violence against women and I'm, I'm pleased to be able to confirm that uh, this is something we've been actively talking about and I can confirm that we will as, as the as, as Kingston Council pursue the white ribbon accreditation, I think that's uh, a really important commitment. I'm pleased to be able to announce that tonight. It'll have senior sponsorship both on on the officer side and, and the councillor side, and will kind of involve three main phases: one around having a, a that broader conversation with 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 the community, talking to uh, our own population about where and uh, where and where they, they do and don't feel safe. Uh, but also it will be trying to uh, increase our efforts on the multi-agency working I was talking about earlier. Uh, but also looking around you know, changes to the physical environment where we can work with, with um, the owners of uh, both in our own land and owners of other property and land across the borough to make spaces safer. But also preventative work and sort of referencing what I was, was saying earlier. You know, that, that, is, that is long term work, but it's incredibly important work to actually you know, look to actually have the conversation about, you know, Including, you know, you and young young men and boys, you know, what it actually means to be a man in a in a healthy way and having healthy view, attitudes towards women, and we'll be doing a lot of preventative work with schools and in our youth settings as part of that long term commitment. Okay. Uh, so, very, very pleased to confirm that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Cohen. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we've got a lot of questions to get through in half an hour. But thank you for that very right comprehensive reply, Councillor Bass. If you have a question for Councillor Kirsch, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Sorry, just toggling between screens. Um, so my question to Councillor Kirsch. The Conservative government have once again stepped in to rescue the finances of the council, this time in relation to the inherent issue in the dedicated schools grant, which dates back to 2012. The government's ongoing rescue package is dependent on the council pumping in more money from the general fund and making significant savings in the dedicated school grant. What happens if the savings are not made and the government then rightly withholds the rescue funding? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kirsch, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Boss, for your question. And uh, as you already rightfully said, there's a historical issue of underfunding. And the um, Department for Education has recognised that on a national level, uh, SAND services are, have not kept up with the growing levels 
of demand since 2012-2014. And in a positive way, the DFE has taken several steps to recognize and to start to resolve these issues, including commissioning a national review on support for children with SEND, providing year-on-year -year additional funding to all local authorities with high needs education responsibilities, and engaging with a smaller number of local authorities to explore longer-term solutions, including additional safety wall funding. And this has happened uh, with our borough. And Kingston was in the first bunch of local authorities who have engaged with the Department for Education regarding longer-term plans and the safety valve funding to address these historic funding shortfalls. And uh, these uh, successful discussions uh, led to an arrangement with the DFE for th additionally 30 million in grant funding, which will be made available subject to our successfully implementation of the improvements outlined in our SEND Futures Plan. The SEND Futures Plan is the Royal Borough of Kingston's partnership plan to both improve services for children and young people as well as to bring the spending more into line with available funding. Uh, 12 million extra funding have been already received in recognition of the progress already made in improving the position. A successful implementation of the plan has been and will be continued to be administration. The plan is challenging, as we all know, but we are confident that we have found a good balance to ensuring we continue to support children and young people, as well as to improve the financial position and reduce the deficit on the dedicated schools grant over the time of the arrangement with the Department for Education. There is the recognition by both the Department for Education and uh, the Royal Borough of Kingston that the plan will need to be reviewed at least annually and updated to reflect progress made, as well as possible changing uh, changes in the context of the plan. The Royal Borough of Kingston will be submitting quarterly updates to the Department of Education and will also meet uh, with the Department for Education at least annually. Where initial plans cannot be achieved due to uncontrollable factors, the Council will work with the Department for Education to identify alternative solutions. Thank you, Councillor Cash. Councillor Bass, do you have a supplementary question, please? Um, no, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bass. Um, Councillor Dunstan, you have a question for Councillor Kerr, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Due to the reduction in the number of COVID-19 cases and the easing of restrictions which started on 12th of April, can the leader please outline what steps the council has taken as we come out of lockdown in terms of reopening the town centre, public buildings such as libraries and working with local businesses to help high streets reopen safely and monitoring visitor hotspots? Thank you. Councillor Kerr, please. Thank you very much for that question, Councillor Dunstan. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating businesses across the borough and of course our partners Kingston First for the fantastic set success of our reopening. It's a real tribute to the resilience of our business community and of Kingston itself. We know that the whole country has suffered a prolonged economic shock, but it's our ambition to see Kingston buck the trend and back, bounce back fast and be transformed into something better than it was before the pandemic. So it's pretty good news that weekly footfall figures at Clarence Street show that Kingston Town Centre is almost at 2019 levels. Footfall last week was down 4% compared with the same period in 2019. And if you look at that in the context of Greater London, which is down by 36%, or the rest of the UK, which is down by 27%, you can see that Kingston's doing very well. And this is achieved by working the way that the administration works best, working collaboratively with our partners. I'd like to thank council officers who've worked very hard to ensure that all our high streets right across the borough have opened safely and successfully. They've been advising on best practice to keep your premises COVID secure, making sure that retailers understand the legal requirement and, and sorry, and I should say in hospitality, the hospitality sector too, to use the NHS QR code for the test and trace program and of course to make sure in restaurants and pubs that bookings comply with the rule of six. We've got COVID marshals out and about encouraging people to follow the hands, face and space advice in the town centre. We've been promoting pavement licences to encourage outdoor dining. We've processed 30 applications. We've opened up memorial gardens in the town centre and put out picnic benches to encourage better use of the space. And it's great that the enterprising spirit 
runs right across our borough from the success of the return of Surbiton Farmers Market to the reopening of Chessington World of Adventures. And you asked also about our libraries. Five of our libraries have reopened. I'm pleased to say that there have been two and a half thousand visits since they reopened and six and a half thousand items have been borrowed. And the remaining two libraries, Old Malden and Tolworth, will reopen in the summer. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary council answer? No, I don't. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Aurora, you have a question for Councillor Davey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, question for Councillor Mole. No. Is that correct? We have Councillor Daly here. Who is your question for? Councillor Mole. Councillor Mole. Yes. It could be Councillor Davy who responds. I, I don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Davy, are you um, prepared to respond to Councillor? Yes, Mole? I am. Yes, I'm expecting to. Yes. Okay, well, no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the Lib Dem Manifesto in 2018 pledged to build 1,000 new council homes over the next four years. With a year to the deadline now, uh, how many homes could I, Madam Mayor, please ask? How many homes have been built? And how many do you predict will? Be completed by May 2022. Thank you, Councillor David. Thank you uh, for your question. Please, may I correct you? The Liberal Democrat Manifesto states the Lib Dem Council will be will build 1,000 new homes, not 1,000 council homes. You need to read them our manifesto. Since May 2018. 1,100 additional homes have been built in Kingston. But you've given me an opportunity. My favorite thing is to boast about building council housing in Kingston for the first time in 30 years. We've already built 17 new council homes in the hidden home scheme, under the hidden home scheme. We've got 101 new council homes on the small sites. And then if our plans are passed later this summer, we should be heading for 767 new council homes on the Cambridge Road, Road Estate. I'm very proud and that our administration is very proud of being the council the first time in 30 years to be building council housing and I do recommend reading the Lib Dem manifesto. Thank you very much. Thank you Councillor David. Councillor Aurora, do you have a supplementary please? I do not. Thank you Madam Mayor. Thank you Councillor Aurora. Uh, Councillor Patrick Sumner, you have a question for Councillor Gander. Councillor Sorry, Madam Mayor, I was just trying to find my um, the notes for the question on. You have a question for Councillor Gander, please. I do. Coombe Wood Golf Course is one of a number of council owned sites that are at risk of losing their sink status, sites of, much of importance to nature, nature conservation. A number of biodiversity issues have been raised in relation to the site, including damage to, the, to a substantial banjo site, a felling of trees and the erection of a coal mounted net that could interfere with the site's bird population. In 2019, this council declared a climate emergency. Does the administration agree biodiversity should be in a hands-on council owned land? And with this in mind, what actions have been taken to ensure all causes of releases for these sensitive sites are being fully adhered to. Thank you. Councillor Gander, would you like to reply, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Falchikoff, for your question. Um, you're referring, of course, to the independent review of the borough's sites of importance for nature conservation, or SINCs, which took place last year and which resulted in six additional wildlife areas being formally recommended to receive SYNC status. The review was initially guided by local, a local engagement exercise with community groups and ecological experts who helped put forward various sites for consideration for SYNC status. SYNCs form vital components of the ecological network and green corridor in the borough. The council is the landowner of the Coombe Wood Golf Course and it is managed by the golf club. 
the biodiversity of biodiversity officer visited the site to assess the situation that you refer to. While on site, he had a conversation with their grounds maintenance staff who provided some background on their rationale for the structure's installation. The nets were of a significant size and the biodiversity officer's opinion was that they could result in a potential infringement of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, possibly having a detrimental impact on locally nesting birds. Since the visit, the lease has been referred to, uh, which but the lease unfortunately has limited mention of ecologically related clauses. However, due to the tenant not going through the appropriate planning process and potential impacts to protective species legislation, I understand that the council's enforcement team has now engaged with the situation and requested that the nets be dismantled. I do agree that biodiversity should be enhanced on all council-owned land and the council will take every opportunity to engage and encourage more favourable management of the land at Coombe Wood Golf Course for the benefit of badgers and birds and any species. <laughs> Uh, do you have, could I ask everybody speaking to turn to mute, please, because we're getting quite a lot of feedback. Councillor Sumner, uh, do you have a supplementary, please? I do. Thank you, Councillor Gander, for your response, but it didn't really answer my question. My question was, what are you doing to actually um, in, enforce the terms of the lease? I've seen a copy of the lease. There are several clauses within that lease that could be, which the, in my opinion, I'm not a solicitor, um, could be contravening of that lease. For example, any tree is not allowed to be felled or limbs lobbed nor shrubbed without the council's express permission. The tenant is not allowed to make additional entrances or gateways into the site without the council's permission. They have erected, they have allowed a gate to be installed next to the large badger set without permission. They are also not allowed to have any structure that would require planning or apply for planning without the council's set permission. So they would appear to be on a number of, on a number of different points actually not following the terms of their lease. And so surely the council has every, every power to actually look at that lease and ask, well, no, demand that the tenant actually adheres to the terms of their lease. Um, sorry, the, the, the sound was a bit distorted. I, I think um, you, you finished. Um, no, I yes, hadn't finished. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I hadn't. Thank you for telling me when I'm finished. That's really kind. But yes, um, I, was, I was asking why you haven't done anything in order to ask the tenant. Councillor, I'm going to ask for supplementary questions, not statements. So I appreciate your concern and your anxiety, but perhaps you would like to discuss it with Councillor Gander as a Madam um, Mary, it was clearly a question. The question was why nothing has been done to enforce the lease. That is the question. I think Councillor Gander, do you feel you've asked that? Um, you've that? No, that's fine, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd be more than happy to hear about hear evidence of the terms of the lease not being um, adhered to. As I've already mentioned, there was um, we have picked up that. Uh, the planning process wasn't gone through properly and if there is additional there are additional breaches of the lease then I'd be happy to hear about them so Councillor Sumner if you would contact me and let me know what they are and we can follow them up. In the meantime um, as I said we are in contact with um, the uh, management of the golf course and we hope to have a dialogue to encourage them to uh, protect biodiversity on the sites that they run. I think we've lost the uh, mayor here. Uh, 
can we just um yes, we appear to have a technical problem yes i will ask for a short adjournment yes So um, I just need to inform you that the email with the renumbered amendment should be should have appeared in your inboxes now. But we will continue with the and move on to the next question. Councillor Young to Councillor Sweeney, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh Fortunately, I have a very succinct question, which is lucky given the uh, issues with sound. Could the portfolio holder for leisure provide an update on the progress of plans for the rebuilding of the Kingfisher Leisure Centre? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be equally succinct. Um, a report to the Response and Recovery Committee on the 13th of May will provide a full update on the progress of a replacement community leisure centre on the site of the existing Kingfisher Leisure Centre. And um, I will, will declare also that you know, when we um, set out our plan on the 26th of November, 20, November 2020, um, we set a deadline for the end of, of um, 23. And we're still on track for that, but um, come to response and recovery, and we'll we'll provide all the details there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sweeney. And um, the last question is from Councillor Cunningham to Councillor Gander. So, Councillor Cunningham, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, why have the Council Environmental Services declined under her watch to such an appalling level that one of the administration's own councillors is now having to? embark on a weekly clean out of the gully, gully pots in their own ward to stop roads flooding. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Cunningham, for your question. Um, as, as you will know, road gullies in Kingston are scheduled to be cleaned once every two years, as a minimum, by RBK's street cleaning contractors Veolia. In addition, a special clean program is undertaken every year, which targets those gullies that have been inaccessible due to parked cars. And of course, residents can report blocked gullies to the council uh, when, and then Veolia is instructed to clean them out. Occasionally, once on site, our contractors find that gullies can't be cleaned because of tree roots having encroached, or if the gully has collapsed or is blocked by materials disposed in the vicinity. In those circumstances, they're referred to the highways team to arrange inspection and clearance or repair by the council's highways contractor. It's not an exact science that dictates when our often aging underground infrastructure will fail. And I don't accept your analysis that environmental services have declined under my watch. On top of the council's proactive and reactive work, Norbiton residents appreciated Councillor Waring's actions 
which are simply an example of one councillor's hard work and connection to his community. Um, I believe you wish to comment. Could you make this brief, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Seeing as the question was referring to my recent efforts to clear and successes in clearing gullies here in Norbiton using a trowel, I want to make it clear that contrary to the question, I don't feel I have to do this. I choose to do this. It's hugely enjoyable, massively rewarding, and it makes where we live a better place. We call it community spirit round here, something the opposition would do well to welcome and encourage rather than demonise and politicise. Thank you, Councillor Ware. That finishes, that is the oh, last... Sorry, uh, Madam Mayor, am I not going to get the opportunity to a supplementary? It's not actually usual to have other people answering it as well. I should have asked you if you had a supplementary, that is my fault. Um, no, it's not usual for other people answering it, but because Councillor Waring was the councillor um, referred to, he just wanted to clarify the point. That's all right, that's fine. But would you like to um, ask your supplementary, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the question may be, have been tabled in a rather trivial way, uh, and the fact that Councillor Waring chose to do so just underlines the point that it was necessary. Now, I don't do social media myself, but following his uh, uh, Facebook uh, uh, item, I've had a number of comments from areas <coughs> in my own ward and elsewhere from residents who are also suffering the problems of block gullies. Yes, of course, we do a planned maintenance, but obviously last year was a particularly wet uh, uh, year. And we know that when that happens, in fact, gullies block more than usually. So I would again say to Councillor Gander that uh, my experience is that things are blocking very much more than they did in the past. And I would again ask her to have a review of it and send out and do a survey on them generally, because they will find, <coughs> in my experience, that there is a necessary uh, requirement to check out and do more cleaning on gullies. Do you wish to comment, Councillor I just wish to thank Councillor Cunningham for his suggestions, which I'll discuss with officers. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Hughes has just um, wishes to remind Want to, has asked me to remind everyone that the chat functions for indications and wishes to speak on points of order and not commentary. And he's, of course, absolutely right because uh, the public are unable to see the chat function, so we need to restrict it only to those things. Thank you. We will now move back, having finished the questions, we will now go back to the amendment. You should all have received it in your inboxes. It is now published on the web as well as I understand it. On the uh... oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a point of order from Councillor Bass? Um, yeah, no, I did. Um, and I know I put it in chat functions, but I find it extremely unusual that Councillor Waring was allowed to talk. I don't think we, as opposition, would have been allowed to talk on a question session. And remember, we are in Perda, or whatever we're allowed to call it these days. So I think we're. I think the administration is say, sailing a little bit close to the wind electorally at the moment and I think we need to be very careful. Thank you, Councillor Bass. Um, yes, we do all need to be careful, you are right. But um, Oli, Councillor Waring made a point of personal explanation which is unusual but is within, uh, is, is, is principle. So, but thank you for that and yes, we do all need to remember your point. Madam Mayor, I did not mention Councillor Waring by name in yes. my... Uh, if he could ask in advance if he could, if he could, make, if he could um, clarify, and so uh, after consultation with um, Mr. Marston, it was agreed it is permissible in regulations. So thank you. We will now move back to the previous item, number seven, and you should all have received the um, renumbered and clarified amendment in your inboxes. So we will once again uh, adjourn.
It's now 20 past 8, so we will reconvene at 8.30 as everybody has had a chance to look at the email advance. So um, we will reconvene at 8.30.
temporary amendment. Thank you, members. We're now going back to the amendment on the motion, so I will ask Councillor Kerr to introduce the amendment, please. And would any members who wish to speak on the amendment please type their name to the chat function now. Thank you. Councillor Kerr. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, so, returning to, um, to the public health debate, I wanted to start by saying that we do applaud your concern about public health and largely agree with much of this motion, but we think it's unfortunate that you didn't research what the Council's already doing before writing it, and indeed look at your own government's public health priorities. Public Health England's strategy from 2020 to 25 stated very clearly that the top two causes of early death and poor health were smoking, which nobody would be surprised about, and obesity. Your own government made it clear that excess weight makes it harder for the body to fight diseases like cancer, heart disease, and COVID-19. And to quote from the government website, while staying active is important, improving diet is most critical. So it's a pity that you've produced a motion which ignores the most important problem and focuses on the secondary problem. As participants in the Health and Wellbeing Board, we were surprised that you overlooked the question of obesity, which along with mental health has been identified as a major public health concern for this council. And indeed in Kingston, 17% of children in reception are overweight or, ob or obese, and that rises to 31% by the time they reach year six. But it's not the only reason that we felt the need to amend this motion. Time and again, you seem unaware of what's already in train. You call on the council to do things we're already undertaking. You require us, for example, to replace the Kingfisher, now, I scratched my head when I saw that because Councillor Davis and Councillor Bass were at the meeting of the Response and Recovery Committee in November when our administration committed to doing that. In fact, you enthusiastically endorsed our decision. I don't know if you're suffering a little from amnesia that you feel that you have to require us to do something which we proposed and we're pushing ahead with. Let me assure you we're working flat out on this to make sure that we hit every milestone in the timetable. And the first of those was public engagement. And I'm sure you'll be delighted to know that two and a half thousand people took part in our engagement exercise to tell us their views enthusiastically about the new leisure centre. You say also that improvements to the public realm should be a priority for the council. Well, they are. That's why we're so keen to open up access to the hogs mill. To, we've already improved Memorial Gardens, why we want to landscape Thames Street, why we celebrate public art on the underpass in Tolworth and we're delighted with the new one public estate funding we've won to transform the station forecourt at Tolworth. I don't need to go through each point one by one but time and again you're asking us to do something in this motion which we're already doing and in the interest of accuracy we felt we needed to amend it. Thank you Councillor Kerr. Um, Councillor Ryder Mills, you wish to speak? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I didn't realise I was first. Um, yes, uh, I take um, what Councillor Kerr just said a, a little further. Uh, the original uh, motion appeared to be some sort of strange combination of motherhood and apple pie, and what was not quite possible or not the most important. And I'll just take one example of that, and I'm not going to refer to paragraphs or anything. I'm just going to refer to the, the, the sentence on lobbying the Royal Parks Agency, because that consultation closed some time ago. They've made their decision. Of course, we should keep on trying to get them to amend their decision where it's wrong. Uh, I have a fanciful idea of, um, of imposing a, a, a congestion charge type system for cars that drive right through the park without stopping um, and thereby free up space in the park for those who want to stop or, or if in, indeed if they pay the charge they can just use the car the, the, the park to drive through i recognize that i'm in a minority of about one and a half on that suggestion so i'm not going to press it any further but Excessive parking charges, yes. So I would hope that um, that the uh, Conservatives are, are going to support the MP there in her ambition to get season tickets there. 
but really that doesn't solve the problem for lower earning families to be, to get into the park what will do that is better public transport because the real families in need don't own cars so parking charges have no effect on them uh, so please let, let's get the right priorities and let's let, what about better public transport to and around the park and really help the people who cannot afford cars thank you thank you councillor Ragnos. councillor Daly, please thank you i welcome the opposition's interest in healthy living but i don't think they've understood the enormity of the challenge facing us uh, as we've heard obesity and its related diseases is one of the biggest killers in this country 57.4 percent of kingston's adult population is overweight or obese kingston has an adult population of about give or take 140,000 adults so it's about 80,000 adults we're talking about a few exercise bikes and fitness classes in our parks is just simply not going to do the job this is a big job you've got to have ambition and that's what we have. We are far more ambitious. That's why we've decided to adopt the whole systems approach, tackling obesity and healthy living in Kingston. We're working with our partners on the Health and Wellbeing Board to create a shared vision and coordinated actions. We're already, as a council, promoting the daily mile in our schools. 47 of our schools have been awarded the Healthy, healthy School London status, five achieving the gold standard. Good health is often linked to access to healthy food. Therefore, through AFC and Bright, the Brightbox scheme, we're supporting 280 of our most vulnerable families to cook and eat healthy food each week by providing food, recipe cards and cooking utensils. We want to enable people in Kingston to live healthy lives. That means going beyond our parks and our leisure facilities. It means looking at every aspect of life in Kingston. For example, how can we enable our, our cafes to promote health? How can we use the local plan to promote a healthy lifestyle? Even in housing, how can we use our housing to promote a healthy weight? For example, research has shown that if you, are, if you sit down to eat your meals, you have a lower BMI than if you don't sit down. So what happens to the families who cannot afford tables and chairs? We've got to work out a way to get them those tables and chairs. Tackling obesity and overweight requires a change in lifestyle a whole systems approach, a whole council approach, which will enable our residents to do just that, change their lifestyles and change their lives for the better. I ask you to support this amendment. Thank you, Councillor Davey. Uh, Councillor Shaper, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We're delighted in, in Surbiton neighbourhood to have adopted our community plan. Built around resident feedback, we are looking at developing and promoting the neighbourhood's parks, streets and open spaces to encourage more outdoor based activity. We'll be focusing post COVID on supporting investment and future maintenance in these assets. We'll be working with the local community, including residents, neighbourhood managers, parks officers and other stakeholders, including voluntary organisations and local charities. We will be identifying and implementing local projects which will make a real difference to people's lives and where we can build resilience and help and support residents to stay fit and well for longer. It will be a collaborative and collective effort with clear public health and community environmental benefits. Obesity has the potential to severely impact us as a population in terms of our health and well-being, including more long-term health conditions such as diabetes, as well as physical complications such as poor mobility or joint problems. Having a more sedentary lifestyle can also make it harder to manage an enjoy. Councillor Shepherd, I'm afraid we've lost you. This is not to or that hate not including anxiety. We have um, lost your connection. So that's a summary, please. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, 
I mean, I just really want a couple of points on, on this amendment. Um, I do think some of the changes in language are just a little bit, can we just say a little bit petty? And, um, and, and but yeah, however, that, you know, if that, if that floats the administration's boat, then go ahead. Um, but what I would like to say is I'd like to point out, you, you, in point 10 of your amendment, you say about how you're enhancing the uh, open spaces of Kingston. I wonder what the slow worms at Kings Meadow would have to say about your commitment to enhancing public spaces at, um, and also the trees at the King Meadow, not for the trees at Holwood Court Farm, what they feel about you enhancing the public realm. Um, I'd also like to point out that the parks, for example, I was I apologise, Madam Mayor. And... So I do apologise, Madam Mayor, I lost connection. Would you like me to uh, restart at another time or continue as I was? Uh, Councillor Sumner is a member making her point now, and I don't know if you know that because you have lost collection, but she is. So if you could mute, and we'll go back to Councillor Sumner, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah, I do apologise. Thank you. I'll, I'll just I'll start again then, shall I? Um, so yeah, regarding point ten, where you say about enhancing the public realm, I would, I, there's lots of I would like to point out. You know, I don't think the slow worms at Kings Meadow feel the same. I don't feel the trees at Tolworth Court Farm, which were cut down, will feel the same. Um, nor will the, the trees that are going to be cut down at the Cambridge Road Estate will be feeling particularly pleased at the moment about the council's commitment to improve the public realm. Um, but, but apart from all of that, what I would say is that you put forward this motion, the amendment to a motion, and you talk about the Conservatives not really reading, reading what's in council papers and not paying attention. But I'd like to point out, 38 of you managed to produce an amendment which is inaccurate. Your original amendment was a mess and it was inaccurate. 38 councillors were involved in that, plus the office staff that you have. And yet you ask, you ask us to trust you with, the, with our council's open spaces. You also stated, you said that you, you criticised Council Davis quite heavily for not, for not using council material. Well, I'd just like to point out, earlier on I was criticised for using, using a term for um, the restricted period. Um, and was told that it was outdated and it was it wasn't it was no longer used. But I'd like to point out it's used in the council's own material in their own pre-election briefing for May 2021. And so perhaps Councillor Bit Ledbetter could withdraw her criticisms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cunningham, please. Oh, Councillor Chair, I'm sorry. Can we get back to Councillor Shape, please? Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will just literally carry on as I, as I left. I apologise for the break. Um, we acknowledge that lockdown has been a challenge for many of us, and for some, going outdoors for perhaps a walk or a cycle has literally been a lifeline, but for others less able, it's been hugely frustrating and unsettling time. We have set out our objectives in our plan to encourage as many people as possible and for all ages and abilities to use and enjoy our outdoor spaces and where appropriate to meet people for social interaction. Our more vulnerable residents do need our help and support. There are places in our community and parks where residents can enjoy physical activity and areas where they can relax and unwind and we need to encourage and enhance their use as much as possible. We're delighted that Friends of groups and local charities and other organisations are committed to projects which enhance and improve the local area and make our outdoor spaces, places attractive and accessible. Working with parks officers, we're currently looking at various options involving improvements and completions to footpaths, enhancing outdoor exercise equipment and upgrading sports surfaces. We look forward to updating you on this in due course. Examples of some of the other exciting projects which have already been undertaken or are soon to be implemented include a new pathway in Fishponds Park has enabled local residents including wheelchair users to move more easily around the park and explore its many attractions, pond life, bird life, insects and plants. Residents will also be able to grow their own vegetables in the new community allotment garden in Fishponds Park. The key thing about the project is that it's in partnership with Visit Visions of Hope, who are a local charity. The garden will involve people in the community, particularly more vulnerable people, including elderly residents and those with mental health issues. There will also be a biodiversity element via bio boxes and a wildflower verge. There will also be planters at heights to enable wheelchair users to handle long tools.
Benefiting from SIL funding, the boardwalk project in Six Acre Meadow site will encourage residents and visitors of all ages to the area to learn more about the local biodiversity and wildlife. We are encouraging the local community to help shape and drive this work. That's why direct community involvement in the preparation of projects is so important. And I'm very much looking forward to the transformational work that we and other partners are doing in the months ahead. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham, did you wish to speak? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yes, uh, I've got no difficulty you want to put continuing down. I think our point is that it's not being done sufficiently and it needs to be expanded. Although on continuing, I would pick you up on the point regarding the Royal Parks, because I've just read the actual response which uh, Ian Price put down on behalf of you. And it, it does go on to say about the effect that the parking charges will have on the surrounding roads doesn't say it's too excessive. It says, um, in light of, the, of these, um, um, we consider, uh, we would, sorry, we would ask that you give reasonable consideration to help fund any parking ch charges we have to make. In other words, your response wasn't that the charges were too much in the park, it's that we wanted more money around the, uh, around the park in order to impose uh, restrictions around the park. So I'd query that. As far as actually the park is concerned, I actually agree with uh, Dave Ryder Mills. I think that the idea uh, of a toll is a good idea. And it was voiced and discussed a decade ago with, uh, uh, with uh, Zach Goldsmith. and. and as in fact is the season ticket. Now I was at the meeting two weeks ago with the chief executive of the Royal Parks Agency and he's not correct to say that it's all been decided because it is another item where it has to be done and confirmed by the minister and in fact it requires legislation to put it in so it hasn't been done uh, and I think it's in a point that it's important uh, to us Moving on to the point that was made about the swimming pool. I mean, I, I went uh, today, the, the leader was very uh, uh, strong in her commitment in order to do this. And the, she said this was her um, uh, um, first priority on the development on the town centre. And therefore, I accept that that may be her priority. What we don't accept is the timescale she is talking about under the mechanism that she's talking at the moment is to be fulfilled, which is why we're trying to tie it down to get a specific time. And that's quite a reasonable position to take. Uh, and and uh, we're not denying what she's saying. I'm not even denying that she, uh, uh, she feels she can do it. But we are saying that you need to confirm it strongly in a resolution and take uh, uh, action so that if it doesn't go through, there will be sufficient money to build it in order to do it in time. Uh, as far as, um, sorry, am I being cut off? Um, uh, as far as as far as the uh, um, the items are concerned, the part of the of the uh, our original motion was not just about uh, obesity, because the use of parks and areas isn't just a question of uh, people being overweight. Is that for, right? Uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's a question of, um, uh, of people's mental health as well. Going out into parks, going out is something which is important. It's not just to lose weight. Uh, and I do enjoy going out. It doesn't help me to lose any weight, but it certainly is helping me uh, to relax. So uh, I think it's a pity that you have sliced our emotion around um, and I, I, I will not be uh, voting for it. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Cunningham. Um, Councillor George, please. Thank you very much. Uh, this motion's all about what you're already doing. But we're saying it's not good enough. You know, we want better, as do the residents. The Conservatives want access to the parks for all, See at the point of delivery, the Lib Dems are happy to whack up charges that punish the poorest in the borough, preventing them from accessing open spaces. 
The Conservatives want to increase and improve open space. The Lib Dems are apparently fine with it as it is. The Conservatives want to ensure better health and fitness facilities. The Lib Dems don't. The Conservatives demand a swimming pool reopen as soon as possible and for it to be guaranteed. And indeed, look for ways of providing at least another pool in the borough. The Lib Dems are using weasel words and residents should be very concerned. The swimming pool, currently closed, is not safe in Lib Dem hands. Now the Lib Dems are whacking up multiple high density towers all over the place, ensuring local families and children go out without adequate place space and gardens. In fact, you're famously building a tower on a playground in Coombe Hill Ward. Our motion would address this, at least in some way, by improving parks, health facilities and open spaces. But the Lib Dems just don't care about Kingston's children. This is an ill thought out, or perhaps a cunningly well thought out weasel word in motion from an arrogant council that refuses to meet the needs and leisure and health desires of Kingston's residents who pay about the highest council tax in the country. It's quite shameful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor George. Um, Councillor um, Kirsch, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I would like to heartily disagree with uh, Councillor George and uh, rather follow up on what uh, Councillor Davy and Councillor Shaper already have mentioned. Uh, we need a holistic approach on this, and it's not a one-size-fits-it-all. And from my reading of the original motion, it was suggesting having more exercise classes and especially providing more exercise equipment in our open parks and spaces. Nothing more specific what you want to do in our open spaces. And uh, following up uh, from uh, Anita Shaper's comments, uh, I'm very pleased personally. Uh, last year in summer, we installed at church fields a full circular footpath. And it was a personal joy for me to see how many more people are using the park, using the footpath, and not just uh, more people, but also uh, in a sort of use which we haven't seen before. Families uh, are using it for a bike ride, uh, people on their own on the bike, teenagers, adults, wheelchair users using it. Uh, all sorts of additional use of the park uh, so it's really a joy to see how our residents benefiting from such measures and so i again i hardly would disagree with councillor george that we are not want to improve things that we don't do things so we've done this and it's one of the uh, examples and it worked wonders and uh, I'm really pleased about this. Thank you very much Councillor Kirsch. Um, Councillor Bass, please. Oh blimey, that was quick. I only just put my name on. There was another list. Um, <laughs> anyway, just some brief points um, and a lot of it is quite pertinent to myself and my fellow ward councillors Ed Fran and Ian George because obviously our ward has three of the park gates in our ward, um, which is why I take um, this consultation very seriously in the things that they're doing. And I also attended the meet the latest meeting of the Royal Parks um, with Counts um, Councillor Cunningham, though I was rather surprised. Um, I mean, the Lib said so they're continuing their dialogue with the um, Royal Parks, but there wasn't a single Lib Dem councillor on that meeting, which um, didn't really um, show um, great engagement. Um, on your motion, so you're talking about the holistic approach. Well, to me, that's just weasel words and just very vague, really. I mean, for health and uh, mental health and well-being you know and obesity follows on from healthy lifestyles you can't you can't divorce um the two and for a lot of people that certainly i know and um through kids and school stuff i do with schools and stuff is people get that from access to leisure centers and to parks and I really wish this Lib Dem mantra about being very anti-car would just stop that, you know, it's almost like discrimination against people who have cars. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a lot of money if you have a car. 
I have two daughters in their 20s. They both have cars. One has a car because she drives to East Surrey Hospital every day to deal with COVID patients. The other one drives to Frimley Park as a student midwife. Do we not want those? Do we then have to discriminate against these young healthcare professionals because they have a car? No. So if people have a car and they want to be able to access the park with, you know, a gaggle of children or a carload of children, perhaps with their friends, or as a daily dog walker, please let's lobby the park effectively, the Royal Parks effectively, to make sure these people can still access it. Because walking around your streets and everything like that is not the is not the tonic that you need for your mental health as accessing one of our parks. Thank you, Councillor Bass. Um, Councillor Sweeney, would you like to um, speak now, seconder, please? Yes, I would. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, what interesting discussions and ideas we're getting from um, members of the opposition. And I, I do welcome them. I think it's always good to have a discussion, which I thought is about public health, but you seem to have a other agendas to, to bring in lots of things that have nothing to do with, with public health. And I know that local politics can be fractious at times. Um, so let's try and collaborate and hopefully you can support our amendments, which we have put in with the best of intentions. And I'll try and persuade you all why you, you should vote for them. We can collaborate, and I would like to commend Councillor Netley, for example, for her crucial involvement in the Kingston Sculpture Trail, which is a wonderful example of a councillor on Conservatives and Liberal Democrat, Councillor Lidbetter, working very well with our community, Kingston University, Kingston First, council officers and some local businesses to bring about a very exciting project. Um, so let's try and see if we can do more of that with public health um, at the moment, find some com common ground. Um, it was Kevin Davis, you said right at the beginning, you said we should all pay more attention to public health. But I would say perhaps he's not paying as much attention as he thinks he is. Um, you know, the stuff that we're introducing is simply to remind you of the thinking and the ideas of the Public Health and Wellbeing Board. And this is the committee from where public health in this borough is managed and it consists of not only councillors and officers with titles such as directors of children's services and directors of public health um, and people who have that expertise and knowledge we've got clinical commissioning groups we've got health watch we've got southwest london and st george's mental health trust on that committee kingston hospital trust nhs england uh, and they're all helping shape our public health policies um, and we're listening to them, and I don't think you are at all. Um, on Thursday, the 1st of October 2020, um, that committee set up a task force to refresh the local health care plan for the next um, couple of years in the light of the pandemic. And about six weeks ago, on the 16th of March, that Health and Wellbeing Board met again and reported on their progress um, and Councillor Bass, I'm surprised you, you, you're you saying that you don't agree with a holistic approach, but that's what you've actually voted for when at that meeting, that committee adopted the whole system Marmot approach across Kingston um, to um, bring about and reduce he health inequalities in the borough. Uh, the voting was unanimous on that and yourself and Councillor Fram were in attendance um, at that meeting. Um, so. Um, you know, the other things that they decided to do, um, again, I think it was Councillor Cunningham brought this point, was that we have set up a plan. Um, and so we're telling you now what was going to be in that plan and we're going to, to monitor it. And that's what that committee is doing. So it's very disappointing um, that, um, you know, you, you're now voting against or threatening to vote against something that you've already voted for twice. Um, I would also remind you that, um, you know, the leader of the opposition and the spokesperson for the environmental S sustainable transport have brought this motion, but we've yet to hear anything from your um, public health spokesperson, who bizarrely does, sits neither on the health and well-being panel or the CHIP committee when she is responsible for both of those briefs. So I'd be interested to hear her thoughts. And I would encourage her to vote for our motion because this is her opportunity um, to tell us what she thinks about public health 
um, because she's certainly not being given a chance within her own group either to attend the committees um, where she can have an opportunity to shape our policies and she's not even being allowed to uh, put her name to the um, to the motion that you're bringing forward about public health. So it's very curious that your whole approach to public health seems very disjointed when people who don't seem to know very much about it are talking about it. And those who have the no. responsibility to talk about it are saying nothing. And those who are at committees are now voting against things that they had previously voted for. So um, yes, we need to pay more attention to public health, Kevin. Thank you, Councillor Sweeney. Um, thank you. Um, Councillor um, Bass, do you have a point of order, please? Um, yes, well, I, I was named actually. I mean, um, this council meeting is complete farce. You know, the questions at the start were from, you know, obviously known members making political points. You allow members to speak who are not named. But anyway, anyway, so um, the Health and Wellbeing Board, yes, I did vote for that because it was a start setting up, you know, a working group to go and look at these things. The reason that we don't, I don't particularly like the words holistic approach in in this, in your amendment, is we had some very specific things that we want, you know, watertight sort of, you know, assurance on the Kingfisher, which I'm pleased to say that um, you're saying that you do have plans that come to the R&R. &R. I don't really, I mean, you know me, John, I, I'm just very keen that we get a proper swimming pool. I don't really want to be political about this and we'll work with you if you do it, but, you know, we just want to make sure that that doesn't get pushed back. Um, and also very, very keen that we put what pressure we can on the park um, and that's not in there, and that's the point I was making. But typical of them, that it has to go to personal attacks rather than, you know, the subject of the matter. And I think that's a bit disappointing. Thank you, Councillor Bass. Uh, Councillor Cunningham, uh, you say um, yep. you have been Can you just explain very briefly in what way you were misunderstood, please? Yes, uh, Councillor John Sweeney has just referred to me, and I think he was misunderstanding what I said. I said when we were talking. Uh, about the Kingfisher, that we didn't believe the uh, time scale that was on. That's not going back on our agreement to want it done within the time scale, which is being quoted. And to try and uh, say that we're going back on something is ridiculous. Our view is we want it, we want it as soon as possible, and we don't believe the time scales that were given are realistic. And we, I base that on, on, on some experience on the matter. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Thank you. Your points are noted, and yours too, Councillor Bass. Um, Councillor Kerr, as the mover, mover of the amendment, would you like to sum up, please? Councillor Kerr. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm actually very happy. I think it's getting late. I'm very happy to um, forego <laughs> the right to sum up. Thank you. Councillor Davis, do you wish to speak at the end of the amendment, please? Yes, I do, yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I must admit, when I, uh, despite all the uh, furore over the numberings of the paragraphs, I must admit I was tempted at the beginning of this to move that this is a wrecking amendment, because actually the amendments have got absolutely nothing to do with the motion. Um, the motion is about fitness. It's not about obesity or smoking, which are all wider determinants of health. They're, they are a whole system. I do understand about public health and about the role of the Health and Wellbeing Board. And if you'd been listening, I had said that I didn't think this was something in an area where the Health and Wellbeing Board would have a role. It's something we as a council should take responsibility for and not just think that it can be done elsewhere. This is about uh, the tens of thousands of people in this borough who are not obese, who don't smoke, who don't actually have the issue, many of the issues here, but still are not fit and healthy because they don't take as much exercise as they do and they don't get the opportunity to take as much exercise as they, as they should. Um, this could be because they can't afford the cost of the gyms. It could be because they can no longer have access to the, the slightly discounted gym that was available to them at the Kingfisher. There's a whole range of reasons why we should, in this very different world we're emerging from, where this type of level of fitness, the walking along the Queen's Promenade, the exercising in Canberra Gardens, all those things we should be encouraging more of 
and not let it drift away, as it may well do, unless we actually give them further people further opportunities to do things. That was what the emotion was about. And that's why it's a, it's a shame, really, that we strayed into these wider determinants rather than stick with what the motion was about, which is about the fitness and well-being of everybody, not just those which we have targets for under public health objectives. So that's where we come from this. On the issue of um, the Kingfisher and its reopening, whilst I accept and did vote for, uh, the proposal that we uh, replace the Kingfisher and we explore it through those through the particular methods that have been outlined. As Councillor Cunningham has always said, there's a lot of disquiet and distrust, not just with us as the opposition, but we know widely um, amongst the council and amongst others that we are not going to get the Kingfisher delivered in the time scale that's been committed to. And remember, this is your commitment. Your neck politically is on the line for the third quarter of 2023 you have to deliver by the third quarter of 2023. But what I've got at the minute is not a commitment because it's subject to, it's subject to the business case. So what happens if that business case is poor? Are you just gonna dump the replacement of the Kingfisher? Or are you gonna take a poor business case and just do it anyway because you've made a commitment to do it? One minute. But that's the difficulty of where I think we're fine we are. There is no real commitment here. And whilst I accept that in May at R&R &R, we'll get another report and it will probably come up with a plan for how we might replace it. I will, I will wager, I'll wager now with the lead of the council, a hundred pounds. In fact, no, let's make it a thousand pounds that you will not open the Kingfisher in the third quarter of 2023, and I do hope you'll take that bet. Thank you, Councillor Davis. I don't think that's ever happened to you, Councillor, before, certainly not in my time. Thank you. Um, so we will now move to the vote on the amendment, please. So, um, if there is so, uh, I'm assuming that you wish to go to a roll call vote, but this will not be a new unanimous vote. So, um, Mr. Marston, will you take the roll call vote, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, um, members are now being asked to vote on the amendment. Um, I will call each member in turn and ask you to indicate whether you are for or against that amendment or whether you are abstain. Councillor Adams. Councillor Abbas? Councillor Abraham? Four. Councillor Archer? Four. Councillor Aurora? Against. Councillor Bailey? Four. Councillor Bass? Against. Councillor Bainham? Councillor Bainham? Do we have Councillor Bain? Yeah. Can I ask how you vote, please? Councillor Bain, do you vote for against? Sorry, sorry, I'm voting for the amendment. Sorry, I was having connection problems. Beg your pardon. I couldn't hear properly. Apologies. Shall we return return to you, Councillor Bain? If you're having problems. No, I can hear you. So you're asking me to vote for voting for the amendment. Very cool. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Yeah. Councillor Fiona Bond. Four. Councillor Olivia Bond. Four. Councillor Cobbett. Four. Councillor Cunningham. Against the wrecking of more amendment. Councillor Davy. Four. Councillor Davis. Against. Councillor Dunstan. Four. Councillor Durand. Four. Councillor Edwards. I'm in favour of this amendment. Councillor Folder Hughes. Four. Councillor Fram. Against. Councillor Gander. Four. Yeah. I'm sorry, Councillor Gander. Do you repeat, please? That was four. Thank you. Councillor George. Against. Councillor Goodship. 
Four. Councillor Green. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Heaton. Four. Councillor Holt. Four. Councillor Hughes. Emphatically against. Councillor Kerr. Four. Councillor Kirsch. Four. Councillor Lidbetter. Four. Councillor Mole. Four. Councillor Netley. Against. Councillor Lavalia. Four. Councillor Ryder Mills. Four. Councillor Schaefer. Four. Councillor Self. Four. Councillor Shepherd. Against. Councillor Stewart. Four. Councillor Bouchard, Oh, against. Councillor Sweeney. Four. Councillor Tyola. Four. Councillor Thompson. Four. Councillor Tolly. Abstain. Councillor Waring. Four. Councillor White. Four. Councillor Wookie. Abstain. Councillor Thank you, members. The amendment is carried and uh, Sister Arson says in cooperation to substantial motion. Councillor Cobbett, do you have a point of order? Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, apologies for doing this in a way because I don't normally do points of order because I know it's fairly tedious, but but, but call me old fashioned. I, I kind of thought that generally when we had these roll call votes, your your kind of classic options were to say you were in favour against or to abstain. Uh, so I wondered what your view was on, on the appropriateness of of, of members using their vote as an opportunity to provide further commentary on how for or against the motion they are or what kind of amendment they thought it was because I kind of thought that wasn't in order but uh, I'll leave it with you. Uh, there were no significant breaches there council comment. We would we would um we would uh, not want members to make real statements that there are no significant breaches today. Thank you. Um so the motion is therefore carried. We will now go back to the original motion as uh, proposed by Councillor Davis. Um, Councillor Davis, you have already spoken on it. So if other members wish to speak on the original motion, I have at the moment Councillors Kerr, Lidbetter, Sumner, Gander and Cunningham wishing to speak on the original motion. Could you please confirm that you still wish to do so? If you, if you still wish to do so, could you uh, indicate in the chat function, please? Uh, Councillor Lidbetter, do you wish to speak now? Uh, yes, you do. Th uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Sorry, I was a bit slow on the um, mute. That's fine. I'll just check that you still wish to speak. Right, so first of all, we have Councillor Kerr, please. If you wish to add anything. Um, I wasn't planning to speak, actually, but, um, but since the leader of um, the opposition has, uh, has challenged me to a wager, I thought I probably ought to respond. Um, I am not a betting woman. But I will give you my assurance, which actually we have put in our motion, in our in our amendment to your motion, that we are committed to the timetable and we will give you more information about that in two weeks' time when you hear the business case at the Response and Recovery Committee. Um, I, I, I think that's enough. Tonight is late. Let's, let's, let's get this wrapped up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Lidbetter. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I, I too will keep this this very brief. Um, so um, it was really to echo what my uh, colleagues have said that um, the original motion we felt was um, simply not sufficient to reflect the breadth and depth of things that we have been doing um, to promote public health and improve our environment. I've been to a number of stakeholder meetings with people in Richmond Park. I work regularly with local groups um, helping out and volunteering in gardens, planting trees, and I strongly recommend healthy outdoor volunteering to all our, our councillors. And um, I, I, I'm also very proud of the fact that um, we've, um, we're planting an unprecedented number of trees in the borough. So we've committed to 2,000 during this administration are on target to do this. Last winter, we planted 500, some 500 across the borough most of them in locations chosen by our residents. And I think this is key that we very strongly believe in working closely with our residents in um, working in our parks and open spaces. So um, I think there is so much more to say, but I think that's enough, it's late. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Midletter. Uh, Councillor Bash, your comment about cameras. We do encourage members to have their cameras on where possible. We do definitely ask that members all have their cam cameras on during the vote. But if members are having problems with connection and their audio, audio connection is better if they turn their cameras off, then we do permit that. Although, of course, ideally, everybody would have their camera on all the time. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sumner, please. Thank you, and I'll, I'll now comment on the um, motion as amended. Um, and first of all, can I start just by correcting something Councillor Ledbetter said about plant planting an unprecedented amount of trees um, if you look around the country there are councils that are doing an awful lot more than we are and perhaps I could refer the two places for example ooh, um, like Hackney um, which might give her an idea of what, what actually is unprecedented um, and also point out that a lot of the trees that have planted have done but that is separate to this order um, I would say regarding the motion the main motion to me when I read through the conservative motion was about was about the kingfisher and I supported their comments about how they wanted to rebuild the, the kingfisher and and actually do that in a separate way apart from involving developers which would allow it to be done in a much faster way um I share councillor um Davies concern about the timetable that you've committed to and also the transparency involved and um, I recently submitted an FOI in relation to the consultation exercise, well, I say consultation exercise, it wasn't particularly consultative, um, regarding the reimagining of the city centre and the Kingfisher. And um, and despite the um, the law, which has been confirmed later in the state, I was refused to be given a copy of the contract you awarded to the consultant company, or the emails that you sent to the consultants um, with, with terms of reference for what you've asked for. So I'd say that it concerns me with your lack of transparency and your lack of willingness to consider other people's opinions in relation to how this could be achieved. And, and I listened to Councillor Sweeney talk about how he, he thinks that everyone should be collaborating and working well together. But I'd also like to point out the complete lack of collaboration that has occurred um, in sending an amendment through last minute, which was incorrect factually incorrect and just a mess, despite 38 councillors having seen it. And, and also your lack of co collaboration in actually delivering this. There is no collaboration, but you expect everybody else to be collaborative with you. It is a two-way street, can I just remind you that? It is two-way. And perhaps, you know, you could take a leaf out of the book from people like Councillor White, who is very collaborative in the way that she works. Um, so I actually think the motion as now amended is, is, is just a mess. And um, and it's a shame because I would have supported part of the conservative motion regarding the Kingfisher, if not all of their motion. And now I'm not going to be able to support any of it, which I think is really sad. Thank you, Councillor Sumner. Councillor Cunningham, please, um, as you're the seconder. Uh, well, I haven't got very much more to say. Uh, um, I'll leave it uh, as it is. Thank you. Um, Councillor Davis, do you wish... Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Cobbett is indicated to speak. 
Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll try and be fairly brief. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing through our adult education service uh, in the context of, of the broader health and wellbeing agenda. It was it, it was referenced in the motion and is still in the amended motion. Um, and you know, and I think it's a fair challenge from the opposition that you know we're doing work now, but we can take it even further. So I just want to talk briefly about what we're doing now and 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 and, and a few things that we could go on to do to expand that provision. Um, so in terms of what we're doing now, we have uh, a range, of, uh, an offer where, you know, you actually are uh, exercising and physical moving around such as Pilates and, and yoga and Tai Chi, but we also have a lot of courses that are in the broader well-being space around uh, and nutrition, around uh, body image, around uh, mental health, around resilience. And I think that is important because it's already been referenced earlier in, in the debate. Often, you know, it's a, it's a complex picture and often, you know, the ability to exercise, facilities to exercise are important, but there are often other things that uh, that can come before that for some individuals that enable them to feel they can participate in that. And we try and do both. But looking ahead, because I think we can do more, and I think obviously, you know, we're all thinking about how COVID has affected people and, and, and what the future is now going to look like. And we are trying to, to reorientate uh, our adult ed service around the new need that we think there's going to be in the borough. Uh, we're working on a strategy that will launch uh, later this year and run uh, to 2026. Uh, and just to just to mention really just, just three things quickly that we're looking at. We're, we're looking at making health and well-being one of the four key strands of that strategy. Uh, we're looking at working with uh, businesses, employees in the borough about how we can partner with them to, to provide some of that mental well-being training to their workforce. Uh, as part of the wider work on Connected Kingston, we're looking at how we can work with, with uh, GP surgeries and ideally to actually uh, operate uh, some adult ed provision out of uh, GP surgeries because I think that's a real uh, golden thread in terms of kind of connecting people uh, who might find out about courses that could, could really help them that they otherwise wouldn't know about uh, and also specifically around uh, in adult social care with 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 uh, service users and learning disabilities uh, having some courses that are around promoting independence and social connectivity for for, for those users so uh, I, I welcome the challenge that this is an important agenda and there's more we can do and certainly in, in our adult ed uh, service we're, we're well up for that challenge thank you madam thank you councillor corbett and um, councillor davis do you wish to sum up please before we move to the vote uh, i don't think there's anything i could say to sum that up madam mayor okay thank you councillor davis uh, we will now move to the vote on the motion as amended thank you madam mayor so once again this will be a roll call vote and i will ask members to indicate whether you vote for against or abstain in respect of the motion as amended Councillor Abbas. Councillor Abbas. I understand that Councillor Abbas is having some connection issues. Councillor Abraham. Four. Councillor Archer. Four. Councillor Aurora. Abstain. Councillor Bailey. Four. Councillor Bass. Abstain. Councillor Bainham. I'm here and I vote for. Councillor Apologies for that interference. Count Councillor Olivia Bolt. Four. Thank you. It's me, but I can't really hear it. If it is, I'm in favour. Councillor Cunningham. Upstairs. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Davis. Abstain. Councillor Dunstan. Four. Councillor Durand. Four. Councillor Edwards. Uh, I'm in favour of the motion as amended. Councillor Foley Hughes. Four. Councillor Pram. Abstain. Councillor Gander. Councillor Gander. Councillor Gander, are you able to cast your vote? Councillor George. Uh, abstain, thanks. Councillor Goodship. Four. Councillor Green. Four. Councillor Hart. Four. Councillor Heath. Four. 
Councillor Holt. Four. Councillor Hughes. Abstain. Councillor Kerr. Four. Councillor Kirsch. Four. Councillor Lidbetter. Four. Councillor Moll. Four. Councillor Netley. Abstain. Councillor Ravalia. Four. Councillor Ryder Mills. Four. Councillor Schaefer. Four. Councillor Self. Four. Councillor Shepherd. Councillor Shepherd. Councillor Shepherd, are you able to cast your vote? Councillor Stewart. Four. Councillor Pascal Sumner. Still again. Councillor Sweeney. Four. <coughs> Four. Councillor Thompson. Four. Councillor Tolly. Four. Councillor Waring. Four. Councillor Wright. Four. Councillor Wookie. Four. Councillor Yogi Nathan. Four. Councillor Young. Four. Thank you. I will just return to those members who were unable to cast their votes originally. Councillor Abbott. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to, based on missing too much of what was talked about. Uh, um, okay, thank you, Councillor Abbas. If you've missed substantially the, the debate, then we would, we would recommend normally that you do not vote. I will do that. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Shepherd. Yes, yeah, sorry, I only lost a uh, connection very briefly, so I have heard everything and I abstain. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor. And Councillor Four. Thank you, Councillor. Um, there are, um, Madam Mayor, 36 votes in favour of the motion as amended, one against and nine abstentions. The motion is therefore carried. The motion as amended is therefore carried. Thank you, Councillors. We will now move on to the next item, number nine, the constitutional changes and the planning arrangements. Councillor Moll, can you confirm that you are moving these recommendations on page A1, please? I can, Madam Mayor, yes. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Hobbit, will you be the seconder? And if so, uh, will you wish to reserve your right to speak later? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I am seconding the recommendations and reserve my right to speak later if, if needed. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Um, are there any other members who wish to speak on this? If so, could you please put your name in the chat function now? I have um, Councillor Moll to move the motion and then Councillors Davis, George and Sumner to speak. Thank you. And Councillor Cobbett to second. So Councillor Moll, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and um, apologies for the lateness of this, but as it's gone round um, all the different neighbourhood committees, um, yeah. hopefully uh, you'll be familiar. Um, so yeah, back in January, um, the paper containing the proposed constitutional changes, the planning arrangements uh, around the neighbourhoods and the responses were considered along with residents' comments and have been incorporated into this report we see tonight. The changes were drawn up with the help of an independent planning consultant as part of a review to bring the council's planning processes up to date. Um, these include renaming the Development Control Committee, the Planning Committee and ensuring the procedures for planning committees are now all in one place. Uh, so. Uh, with the consultation that's happened and the incorporation of the comments, um, I'm pleased to uh, propose and support this report and ask you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mark. Councillor Davis, please. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I'm in a rather odd position with this because uh, I don't object to the things that are just directly happening. I mean, they are in the main, and I'll say in the main, a tidying up. Um, of our procedures. I suppose my biggest problem, and probably the reason why I'll vote against this in the end, is that this has taken, by my estimation, about two years to wander through the system. And two, at the end of two years, I always wonder why we bothered, uh, because we're not actually changing very much at all. In fact, we're hardly changing anything except the tidying up of the rules and uh, the standing orders. And I would have hoped 
when we embarked on this, we had some ambition to find better ways to engage in the planning process and to allow residents to access us at meetings and to present to us at meetings. But sadly, we don't seem to have got that. We just seem to have this slight tidying up around the edges and um, removing some some uh, existing powers and concentrating them around offices and chairs of committees. And that me is a shame. And I actually want to protest about that by voting against it because I think we should have done a lot more. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor George, please. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I do have some concerns about uh, some of the wording here. I mean, the, the rules that could stop all councillors from calling any applications to neighbourhood with the gatekeeping arrangements. The new rules can dismiss resident objections if they don't meet planning officers' views of a proper object objection, or if they believe that they can get around it by condition. It will no longer necessarily be a council consideration that decides this. <coughs> the time frame for objections is being made stricter, leaving less time for residents to object or find out the details of applications. The petition and objection letter changes are unclear as to where some objections will simply be ignored in the future. There's definitely room for improvement as far as these rules are concerned. However, the rules being forced through today chisel, chisel away at the rights of residents and ward councillors acting on their behalf to hold the council to account. Over the last few years, the rights of residents as far as consultation and being able to scrutinise the work of the council have been continually eroded by this council. On top of this, there are many instances of planning issues that have gone totally against the previous pledges of this Lib Dem Council. Leaving residents to suffer with degraded greenbelt, tall towers, and building on much needed car parks and even children's playgrounds, with decisions being made in secret meetings, with no way for the public or opposition councillors to have a say or scrutinise. They take away yet more power from residents. And quite frankly, this Lib Dem Council has shown that it can't be trusted with yet another planning power grab. For these reasons, I can't support these proposals. Thank you, Councillor George. Councillor Sumner, please. Rather unusually, I find myself agreeing with Councillor George. And um, I actually think this is a Lib Dem development, a developer's charter. It makes it a lot more difficult for residents to launch objections to planning application. It also, reading it, seems to take away local businesses and um, people that work in the borough's opportunity to comment on um, objections. There's also a number of things in the wording which is contradictory and has no definite meaning. Um, and I also think it's quite discriminatory in some respects. I think the plan to count um, um, pro forma responses to emails as just being one response, I feel is grossly unfair. Um, I feel there's a lot of residents who don't understand or don't know what a proper planning objection in a planner's terms are. And it's very difficult for them to, to access that information and it's very difficult for them to actually express it in, in a way, in, in develop, in, you know, in a planning office to speak and taking away their ability to send a pro forma objection which someone has worded and crafted in the language of planning officers to make it uh, to make it more accessible to the committees by taking away that ability for them to to send that i think you're actually discriminating against a large portion of kingston's residents and um, i also think it's discriminatory in terms of just allowing one objection per household i think i think that's really unfair um, it, you're assuming that everyone in the same household will have the same objection and it, I might object to a planning application on the grounds of biodiversity. Um, someone else in my in my house may object to it on another grounds. And so, by saying that we can only have one objection per household, it's discriminating against the other people within that household. And I'm really surprised that a Lib Dem administration is bringing forward something which, in my view, challenges the Equality Act and is actually it, and is and is very, it does discriminate. The plans to take away residents' abilities to put in um, to submit comments after the 
you know, the legal consultation period, I think is, is a huge change for our borough and is not a good one. Um, a lot of residents don't find out about a planning application until a few weeks into the process. And by which point they try to read it, they've looked on the planning, they've looked on the planning website, they've read the 150 documents that are up there, which isn't, they're not very accessible to read. Um, it can take them weeks and weeks to do it and to say they've got to do it within seven weeks of that planning application being accepted, I think is really unfair. Um, and I think what you're leading to is a situation where residents' voices are going to be crowded out, planning up, planning decisions, and as I say, it's opening up a developer's charter. Um, the, there are many other objections. I was reading the comments that in the in the protocol, the planning protocol for members, and it doesn't seem to fully understand or interpret um, the difference between predisposition and and, and actually um, and, and being predetermined. It One really minute. doesn't. Um, actually, actually um, Fiona, I noticed that many of the Lib Dem councils got to speak over, so I would appreciate if I could too. Um, and I feel that you really need to take this away and think again. I think you've shown already this evening with your poorly drafted amendment, which didn't make sense, was actually factually incorrect, that, that you, there's a lot of work that the Lib Dems need to do in drafting things. And I think this is a prime example. And if, if you're going to vote this through, then I think the residents are going to be extremely, extremely angry with you. Thank you, Councillor Sandown. Um, Councillor Cobbett, do you wish to um, speak now uh, as you'll speak as a seconder, please? Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. I'll speak at the end, if that's okay. I think Councillor Sell wants to speak. I'm sorry, I don't have that. Yes, I'm sorry, Councillor Sell. You had a on the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just responding to the remarks that Councillor Ian George said, um, he, he made comments suggesting that planning decisions were made behind closed doors. Um, I totally refute this. Um, and, feel, and I feel very strongly on this point that all planning decisions, all planning decisions, without exception, have been made openly since, well, be, both before and certainly since May 2018. Um, I feel this is a very, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to make an accusation in a, in a full council meeting that planning decisions have been made behind closed doors, I think is a very strong thing to say. And I think he should actually, and with great respect, Madam Mayor, I think he should withdraw that comment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor George, you have a point of order, but can I just point out this uh, point of order is to reopen the debate, it's to explain why you have been materially misunderstood and just a couple of sentences to explain that. Yeah, that, that's exactly what, why I'm, what I'm doing. Thank so I, I, shall, I shall read out again what I said, just that small part, just so you, you, you can make, we can make it clear. Leaving residents to suffer with degraded green belt, tall towers and building on much needed car parks and even children's playgrounds. With decisions take it, taken in secret meetings with no way for the public or opposition councillors to have a say or scrutinise. Now, I stand by that 100%. I'm not talking about planning decisions. What I'm talking about is a decision forced through by this council to increase the size of the of the building oh, yeah i've got to answer this to increase the size of the building so that you build on the children's playgrounds and the car park and that decision was made behind closed doors with nobody being told it was a smaller it was a smaller application before from the council the council chose to increase the size of it. This is thank not you, a thing. You have a point. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Councillor Self. Councillor Cobbett, do you now wish to um, speak as second, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will. Uh, I'll try and talk briefly about a few of the things, a few of the provisions that uh, that this uh, change would would bring in, and then I'll try and respond to a few things from earlier in the debate if if, if I have time. Um, so a lot of this, you know, has already been mentioned. It is tidying up, uh, but it's important tidying up because you know this is a very important area of council decision making. You don't want a mess in your constitution, and one of the key things it will do is bring all of the planning rules and regulations together, you know, in one part of the constitution. It will also bring in. Uh, the LTA model planning rules, which you know 
take the point should have been done before, but it's better to do it now than to continue not to do it. There are also uh, significant provisions from the local in, in 2011 that we haven't, as a council, incorporated into our, our own guidance and rules that we're now doing. Um, it also changes the name of what's now Development Control Committee to be called the Planning Committee, which I think is, is sort of simpler and easier for most people to, to understand it. It does uh, what it says. Uh, but also there's some important provisions in there around uh, clarifying the relationship between uh, neighbor, the neighbourhood planning function and the planning committee function. Uh, uh, and also I think so, some, some, some welcome changes allowing the planning committee to be more involved in some of the pre-application uh, stage of, of applications because I think that can actually help us to get you know more of what we would want to see at the final stage because it allows that broader discussion when you're not actually under the strict planning rules and making the decision. So I think, I think that is useful. Um, it's hard to know really what, what to respond to the debate because we sort of heard that, that it that there's no point putting this through because it does nothing and, and also heard that it does all sorts of dreadful things so it, I guess it can't be both of those uh, I mean I, I certainly object to the idea that you know we're failing to uphold the Liberal Democrat manifesto in, in planning decisions I mean I never take I, I'm not bearing in mind the Liberal Democrat manifesto one way or the other when I make planning decisions because you know we're literally not allowed to do that because we have to make quasi judicial decisions in, in, in line with the planning rules I'm not acting politically or as a Liberal Democrat when I do that um, and not, none of us should be or whatever party we're from uh, I mean I, I take some of the the points that it is a, it is a careful balance between having you know an efficient planning system that allows you know the, the key applications that need discussion to be being discussed and allows uh, things to progress and, and the development to ultimately happen if it's approved and the, the rights of people to comment on that and shape that and a lot of what came up in the planning committee and when when this was discussed at neighborhoods was around that and I raised points along those lines myself and we have redrafted this substantially uh, to take into account those points so uh, you know I in its earlier form I wouldn't have been happy with where it was now I think we've got that balance right I take it that others disagree uh, but I think while this isn't the most exciting set of proposals in the world, it is something we need to do uh, to, to, to provide to provide clarity and to, to make sure that we're not uh, challenged in the future in the way that we do this. So we'd encourage everyone to support it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Corbett. Councillor George, you have a point of order. Again, could you make it as brief as possible and just stick to the actual uh, misrepresentation that you feel that I certainly will, John, just pick up on the last point there, where, where I didn't say that the Lib Dems didn't follow through on what they promised pre-election. I'm looking now at the Homes Not Towers banners that came out on leaflets from the MP, from I can see the I councillors there. I can see, the councillors. I can see the, the, you know, the, the chair, chair of the planning committee. The Homes Not Towers. The Thank chair of the planning committee said it. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have, if you have concerns, I think that then um, it's possibly best to contact democratic services officers after the meeting in order to clarify these concerns. Thank you. Uh, we now need to go to a vote on. Oh, sorry, Councillor Moll wishes to see. Sorry, you sum up. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, yeah, something that I thought uh, would go through um, without controversy, um, as Councillor Cobbett summed up, um, we've taken into account the comments um, and made changes so that it's now something that, that we're happy to support. Um, just need to cover, up, cover a few things. Um, this doesn't cover the planning process in its entirety in terms of national and uh, regional policy. So things like um, the deadlines for planning applications are covered um, outside of, of um, our council and um, so that we just need to be careful that we understand what we're voting on tonight the changes here are technical ones for our constitution designed to clarify the terminology ensure consistency and inconsistency and be in line with the latest government regulations and policies that they set we are equally um, we are very um, aware of the importance to ensure appropriate development and work hard to achieve this within the constraints of the London plan and government requirements but here we are asking for support to tidy up our constitution. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Councillor Moore. We will now go to the vote. Um, we will now vote on the um, recommendation on page, um, on page A1 of the agenda. So uh, I'm assuming that this will need to be a roll call vote. So Mr. Marson, would you please um, 
and to take the role on that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So once again, I will call members alphabetically, and if you could indicate whether you vote for, against, or abstain in respect of the recommendations on page A1 of the agenda. Councillor Abbas. Four. Councillor Abraham. Four. Councillor Archer. Four. Councillor Aurora. Against. Councillor Bailey. Four. Councillor Bass. Abstain. Councillor Bainer? Four. Councillor Fiona Bolt? Four. Councillor Olivia Bolt? Four. Councillor Cobbett? Four. I think there's a problem with one of Councillor Tolly's records there. Uh, I'm against. Councillor Dunstan. Four. Councillor Durand. Four. Councillor Edwards. Um, I'm in favour. Councillor Foldy Hughes. Four. Councillor Fran. Against. Councillor Gander. Four. Councillor George. Against. Councillor Goodship. Four. Councillor Green. Four. Councillor Hart. Four. Councillor Heath. Four. Councillor Holt. Four. Councillor Hughes. Against. Councillor Kerr. Councillor Kerr. Four. Councillor Kerr. Four. Councillor Midbetter. Four. Councillor Moore. Four. Councillor Netley. Abstain. Councillor Ravalia. Four. Councillor Ryder Mills. Four. Councillor Schaefer. Four. Councillor Self. Four. Councillor Shepherd. Against. Councillor Stewart. Four. Councillor Bouchard Summer. Against the Developments Charter. Councillor Sweeney. Four. Councillor Tyler. Four. Councillor Thompson. Four. Councillor Tolly. Four. Councillor Waring. Maybe Councillor Fram could wrap a tune around that beat. Four. Councillor White. Four. Councillor Wookie. Four. Councillor Yogi Nathan. Four. Councillor Young. Four. Thank you. And Councillor Cunningham. Um, are you able to cast your vote? Abstain. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Madam Mayor, we have 37 votes in favour, 7 against, and 3 abstentions. The motion is therefore carried. Thank you, Councillors. The motion is therefore carried. We will now move to the next item, which is item 10. And this deals with recommendations for the Response and Recovery Committee for the streamlining of the Strategic Committee structure and a number of minor amendments to the Council's constitutional arrangements and contract regulations. So, Councillor Cobbett, will you confirm that you will be moving the recommendations on page, P page B1, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, I will be. Thank you, and Councillor Kirsch, will you be the seconder? And will you reserve your right to speak? Yes, I will second the motion. I will uh, reserve my right to speak at the end. Thank you, Councillor Kirsch. Um, are there any other members who wish to speak, please? And if so, will you please type your name into the chat, into the chat function now? Just. Um Councillors um, Davis and Summer and nobody else. Okay, thank you. Councillor Collett, will you move the recommendations, please? 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I hope to be more successful in uh, amending the constitution than I was in my point of order, because the point I raised earlier seems to have got worse since I mentioned it, so I obviously wouldn't be a very good school teacher. Uh, uh, so moving to the to the constitutional changes, there's kind of three main things that, 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 that this paper does. One section is around essentially the streamlining of strategic committees and, and what strategic committees we would have in the in the forthcoming council year uh, and what they would be called and, and, and what remits they would cover. Um, the uh, second area is, is around um, more sort of procedural changes to the constitution uh, and the third area is uh, some changes to our contract regulation so taking each of those briefly in turn uh, in terms of when we were looking at uh, strategic committees we, we've what we've essentially tried to do is is have a look at the business that's being uh, going through the committees how many items how long the meetings are taking and try to get the right balance between uh, making sure that there is appropriate time for the items to be discussed and appropriate public involvement and, and opposition scrutiny without uh, having more meetings than is necessary to achieve that because obviously there's a there's a time and a financial cost to that uh, I think this uh, running with three committees is, is the right balance we've also increased the, the number of members on each of those committees so that uh, the majority of members would get the chance to participate uh, but because of some of the changes that that would would bring about in terms of uh, of opposition places we're proposing to give um, both opposition parties additional places than they would automatically be entitled to under the proportionality rules to make sure that anyone that's kind of shadowing a brief would, would be at the relevant committee where that policy area would be being discussed. Um, in the uh, second area, uh, I won't run through all of the things that are happening in terms of the constitution there, uh, but it does include essentially making, you know, confirming that the state of the borough uh, debate will be a sort of community engagement event rather than a formal council meeting in line with kind of changes we've uh, already made through practice. Uh, it, uh, it clarifies that we won't have wrecking amendments, which is potentially uh, topical uh, after after tonight. Uh, and it and uh, it also uh, clarifies things like uh, how you make a, a roll call when it happens. I know at the moment, obviously, everything is a roll call vote because we're online. But but in future, when we're, we're in person, it clarifies that uh, and clarifies some of the uh, delegated authority officers as well. And then finally, on the on the contract uh, regulations. The, the main change is, is really just around clarifying the, the, the amounts of money that trigger a contract needing to come to committee uh, and enables the, the kind of rollover extension of contracts to be uh, included in, in that limit. Uh, and there's a few things around bringing our, uh, our procurement rules in line with, with where the UK now is on procurement rules, having, having left the EU. So uh, obviously could say a lot more because there's a lot in there, but it is quite late at night. So I think that will do as a summary for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Cobbett. Councillor Davis, please. I won't speak as fast as Councillor Cobbett, if I, if I, so, so I do apologise for that. But um, broadly, I'm more than happy with this, and we're more than happy to support what's being proposed here. I, I, I make some points just for the record, because I did make them at the Response and Recovery Committee, that the reduction in committees is definitely welcome. It's clear, given the number of items that are coming to committees, um, that there's been a reduction in those items over a considerable period. In fact, we started looking at this back in 2016 as to whether there was a case to be made for reducing some of this because of the amount of business that was going through. Now, having said that, um, there is the other side of that coin. And I, I did make this point at R&R &R that um, a lot of the business that comes to committees uh, is formulated through the delegations. In other words, the things that don't come to committee are obviously clearly delegated. And I would hope that in the next stage of the constitutional review, we have a look again, once again, at those delegations, because there is always a concern that the delegation levels are far too high. And some things, many projects, uh, capital projects, for example, over a million pounds, um, are not come anywhere near um, a committee for decision that is being taken under delegated authority. And I think as a council, we ought to be saying, is that right or is that wrong? The other thing I think we ought to be very clear about is uh, I still feel there is a, a difficulty with the neighbourhood committees. Um, I'm fully supportive of us having neighbourhood committees, but as it currently stands, they are not an efficient use of time for either members or officers or even the public, if I'm frank with you. Um, too often we're getting items that don't need to be at a committee because they are there for noting as opposed to actually there for decisions. And when we do get items for a committee, we're often finding agendas with maybe one or two items that can take hours to get through. 
Now that may be right, that may be wrong, that may be partly due to the nature of the chairing and we know we should be offering chairing training continuously as a council and develop, as a part of the development of a, a, of a councillor. Um, but there's certainly some issues around the neighbourhoods which I think we should be addressing a little bit more rigorously, but this isn't part of that that conversation in a sense. So I'm just urging you to look at those things in the future, both the neighbourhoods and the delegated authorities. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Uh, Councillor Sumner, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this streamlining committee is, I don't think anyone has any objection to the structure being changed if there is need to. Um, but there is, there is just a few concerns but from my end about the, the streamlining of committees. So 18 months ago, we were told that you had to limit residents' participation because there was too much important business that had to be done in committees, were going on too long, and it was interfering with the ability to, you know, at strategic committees to get the job done. And it they were going, because there was so much business coming through and it was taking so long. But now 18 months later, you're saying, you know, there's not enough coming through, they're not, you know, we, we need to streamline them. So I do feel that your previous um, amendments to the constitution, which limited residents' abilities to participate and be heard, I feel have now been shown to be what they were. And, and it was just a political stunt to stop scrutiny for residents and to make it more difficult for them to engage. Um, and I feel that this has highlighted that. Um, regarding the streamlining of committees, as, as, as Councillor Davies has said, that it's obvious the reason why there's less stuff coming to the committees is because the administration is delegating so much to officers to be allowed to um, to make those decisions. And, and if that's the way to go, that you wish to go, that's your that's your choice. You, you are the administration. You're effectively running, you know, a combination of an officer-led council and you know a committee and a cabinet system rather than a true committee system. But if that is the case, and it would appear so based on the evidence then why are we still paying for nine portfolio holders? So if so much more of the if so much more of the business is being decided by officers at delegated at that delegated point, then why are we paying for nine portfolio holders? So if you want to streamline committees and you want to have more to give officers more delegated powers, then you have to streamline your portfolio holders in line with that, in my opinion, um, and actually stop you know, because residents pay for that. And if there isn't as much work coming through, there isn't as much decisions being made, then I think you should you should weigh the scales up a little bit and, and remove some portfolio holders. Um, I won't mention the wrecking amendment because it's obvious. Um, you just did one and I want to get rid of them. Um, so the other point is I wanted to make was regarding roll coal, coal void votes. Now, I'm a big fan of Hansard and, and votes in Parliament where you can see exactly how your MP has voted. I feel that by making it more difficult to have roll call votes, that it's going to be less transparent for residents to see how their individual ward councillors have voted on issues. And I would like actually there to be something on the council website that publishes how every councillor has voted on decisions. And so residents can see precisely what they have backed and supported during their four year tenure as a, as a councillor. And, and, and I feel what's being proposed will, will make transparency more difficult rather than opening up transparency. I'm all for opening up transparency. The final part is regarding contract standing orders. Anybody who's been to council will know that I've been talking about contract standing orders for quite some time. And when the council was um, in a re resistance to actually publish the data they have to by law. Um, in this document, you appear to admit that you've not been following contract standing orders and now you want to normalise or regularise what's already been taking place. Well, I'm actually against that. I think that we should be um, actually following the contract standing orders and, and an officer should be encouraged, well, actually made to, follow what was in that constitution rather than making it increasingly easy for them not to. I feel that that is what residents will want from us as councillors. Thank you, Councillor Sumner. Uh, Councillor Sharper, please. Councillor Sharper? I noticed we have some connection problems. Let's move. Oh, can I just, as a point, um, Councillor Sumner, actually, the voting record is on the website. Um, Councillor George, please. You should speak. Thank you. I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, I don't think I see much detail. I, I'm a bit concerned that there's going to be a loss of expertise. In, in, in some of these um, sort of in, uh, with the fewer committees um, and less time for cons consideration and deliberation on important issues before it comes to voting time. 
Um, the state of the borough, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of, again, moving that away from giving residents a real chance to scrutinise and ask certain questions and, and get a proper feedback. Um, and you're, you're going to do like what you did last time, which was a real puff piece selling yourselves to the public, but not really, not in a meaningful way. Um, and I think that was really disappointing, especially after all the other changes you've made that, that are preventing um, residents having a say. Um, but that's Lib Dem policy, I suppose. It's up to you, Harry, about running the council, stopping proper consultation, preventing proper scrutiny by residents. Um, you know, it's up to you. The residents will judge you, I suppose. Thank you, Councillor George. Um, Councillor Sharper is withdrawing from speaking. So, um, Councillor Kirsch, if you wish to sum up, I second that, please. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, um, yes, uh, so what I wanted to add to the debate as well as or highlight, uh, I think Councillor Corbett has uh, very well introduced uh, the item at the beginning. And I just wanted to come uh, to the one bit which uh, might be overlooked in a way uh, quite easily, but I would like to uh, draw some attention on the contract regulations. I'm very pleased. So uh, we had a cross-party working group on our new commissioning framework, and that's uh, will be implemented soon, but we already implement many on the recommendations of the cross-party working group in the uh, uh, contract um, regulations. So we, uh, every new tendering process now has to take uh, social value into consideration. And again, we firm up our commitment to the London living wage for all uh, our contracts and subcontracts. And also we have a, a strong... Uh, strong view also to uh, towards modern slavery and how we deal with this and so i'm quite uh, pleased that this uh, is already now uh, or will be if you vote this through be implemented in our uh, contracts regulations and um we had lots of talk about uh transparency and scrutiny i just wanted to highlight again uh that, for example, to all changes to the perpetual program, which are uh, delegated to officers, all these changes, all the decisions made there uh, will be reported uh, quarterly in the uh, financial monitoring report. So there is scrutiny, there is reporting back. I just wanted to draw attention here again. And uh, hardly, again, I want to disagree. Uh, I think it's like a deja vu uh, with um, the uh, state of the power debate which was uh, just mentioned again. Uh, uh, it was, I think, a success. We might agree to disagree here. I think it was a success. Residents seemed to uh, agree, or many residents who took part there. Um, so, and we want to move the uh, state of the world closer to residents and more far away from them and giving them more chances to make it interesting and compelling to them and moving also around the borough and not just uh, always being uh, in one place, but giving everybody over the time the chance to participate in a perhaps better way. Um, yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, so we now turn to the Councillor Covick, as the mover of this uh, recommendation, do you wish to sum up? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll try and come back on a few of the points that were raised uh, in the debate. Uh, so Councillor George was talking about um, the state of the borough debate. I mean, I, I recognise there are challenges in, in getting people involved in that and, 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 and engaging people through that. We, we did our best. We had a, a vote on what the topic was going to be and we had lots of questions coming in from the public. I think, I think we could improve it more. But I do think it's the right thing to do to, to make it an event that's focused on engagement, because otherwise it's tied up in the kind of process stuff that we see tonight in a formal council meeting. And we know that engages hardly anyone. So, you know, let's try and do something else. Um, you talked about possible lack of expertise and scrutiny. And, I, you know, I understand that concern. But I'd also say, you know, the other side of that coin is that, you know, it's it's one it's one council and all the policy areas we look at are, are interconnected. And actually, if you have a group of people sitting on a committee, uh, that start looking at, at the links between some of the things we do in, in the way in sort of on the same lines as they're organised operationally in the council. I think that's probably a good thing uh, in terms of how we look at things holistically. Um, Councillor Farrakhan, someone was talking about public participation, and you know we 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 have uh, members of the public in normal times turning up and being able to talk on agenda items as well as simply asking councillors questions. And I, I welcome that. Many, many councils don't do that. We we do. 
But I think, you know, it has to be seen as one stage in a journey. I don't, you know, I think we, we shouldn't fixate on coming to a committee where decisions can be made as the key public engagement point, because actually if that is the, the key public engagement point, that's a system failure, because actually you should be talking to people as you shape the policy rather than simply focusing on how many people you can get in the room to tell you they disagree with it. Or you've got the right to do that if that's where they are, but really you want to avoid that and actually have the participation all the way through. Um, I take Councillor Davis's point around the uh, thresholds in terms of officer delegation and values uh, and we can look at that because this is particularly around this is the annual review of the constitution for this year but we are doing a broader governance review so some some of those points can be can be taken on when we, when we do that broader governance work that, that, that he referenced uh, uh, but yeah I think these I think these are sort of sensible sensible reforms for the for the reasons I outlined earlier so I'll, I'll leave it there thanks. Thank you Councillor Cobbett. Now, we now turn to the recommendations set out on page B1 of the agenda, but please can you know that recommendation, recommendation 2, which seeks to disapply the rules of proportionality in order to offer additional seats to opposition members, must be approved without any member voting against it in order to succeed. Members can stay, but if it succeeds, but in order for it to succeed, members cannot vote against it. So the normal simple majority applies in respect of the rest of the recommendations. So in view of this, if there is not unanimous approval for all the recommendations, um, we may need to take two votes, one specifically on recommendation two, and one on all the other recommendations. On that basis, if there is any councillor who wishes to go to a vote on this item, and again, of course, it will have to be a, a roll call vote, Please would you type your name to the chat function now, otherwise I will take it that all the recommendations are agreed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sumner, you've indicated that you wish a separate vote. So we will now go to a vote on recommendations 1, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Are these recommendations accepted unanimously, please, or do we need to go to a roll call vote? Councillor Sumner has, has um, indicated she wishes to abstain. Does any other councillor wish to go to a roll call vote? I will take it that those are carried with one abstention. Thank you, members. We will now go to recommendation two, which is the one that seeks to disapply the rules of proportionality. Um, do we need to go to a roll call vote on this one, please? No, is everybody happy to accept that unanimously? Is there any, um, any disagreement, please type your name to the chat function now. I take it that... Um that so that is then agreed unanimously. Thank you, members. We will now go to the next item, item 11, which is the Cambridge Road Estate Programme Delivery. The next item relates to the use of compulsory purchase powers as a last resort to acquire land within the boundary of the, of the proposed CP01 area of the Cambridge Road Estate Regeneration Scheme. This again is a recommendation from the Response and Recovery Committee, so it has been through the committee. Councillor Kerr, um, Councillor Kerr, will you confirm if you will be moving the recommendations on pages C1 and C2, please? I will be. And Councillor Kerr, will you be the seconder and... I will second it. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Um, are there any other members that wish to speak? And if so, can you please put on any chat function now? Councillor Sumner, are there any other members? Thank you. 
So, um, Councillor Kerr, will you move the recommendation on page C1 and C2, please? I will. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so just to remind everyone, this item has already been in front of the Response and Recovery Committee and was approved there. It seeks a resolution to allow officers the power to acquire land by compulsory purchase only as a last resort to enable phases one and two of the Cambridge Road Regeneration Project to go ahead. Um, I remind everybody that this is a once in a lifetime generation to deliver new modern green homes for some of our most deprived residents. Regeneration project will provide 1,000, sorry, 2,170 new homes and 707, and so dear, I'm tired, sorry, 767 of those will be council rented homes. Um, remind you as well that the ballot result with an 86% turnout and a vote of 73% in favour showed that there was resounding approval of this plan on the estate itself. And the feeling is that 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 we can't hold the whole estate to ransom. A very small number of properties which were purchased under the right to buy legislation are now owned by private landlords and are the sticking point. In phase one, for example, there is one buy to let landlord who is who it seems highly unlikely is going to reach agreement with the council. At risk is the funding and the timetable for delivery. Um, and it's for that reason that we are seeking this um, final permission to go ahead with um, a compulsory purchase order as a last resort. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Councillor Sumner, please. I'll be very brief. Um, last weekend, I, I visited the Ebury Estate in Westminster and I spoke to um, leaseholders who are going through now what our leaseholders will be going through very shortly. Um, and the tale, the, the, the stories that I heard from them were quite shocking. Um, the undervaluing of properties, one woman who actually is a valuer, by the way, so she knew what she was talking about. Her property was undervalued by £200,000 by the council and the council's valuation company. Now, using compulsory purchase, the, um, they are now proposing that the, um, the agreement within within there would be that they have to meet midway between her valuation and the council's valuation, which means she's losing £100,000 on her property. Now, I don't, I don't like the terms holding the council to ransom for people that are wanting to get what they feel is the best price for their property. I don't think that is fair. I think it is really insensitive language. Um, and, and I really, I am against using compulsory purchases. It all went, as we all know, if we take the examples of the Welsh Harp, the, um, the compulsory purchases used there were were, were horrible. Um, it was a real mess. And whenever we get into compulsory purchases for residence properties, I think it creates a great danger. Um, and I am very concerned about how this will be handled going forward. I know that you I know that you said the best intentions, but I think all councils say that. And then yet, when it comes down to the details and the need to, to expedite a process, I think sometimes we forget that there are individuals involved. And um, so I won't be voting for compulsory purchasing of the homes. And I would just ask that um, that we be a bit more sensitive around the language that we use. Things like holding holding the council to ransom, I feel is really unfair language when we're talking about people that own properties. And do research things like what's happening at Ebury Estate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Daly. Jeez. I think I should point out that Westminster Council and Ebury Estate are very different to Kingston and the Cambridge Road Estate. And the treatment of tenants is very different in Westminster. Having when I cut my teeth as a solicitor fighting Westminster Council in legal aid, I can assure you that Kingston is very different from Westminster. And to compare Kingston with Westminster, clearly you know nothing of housing and housing in London. But then when you're thinking about what the problem is, if we do not bring, have the option of a compulsory purchaser, what will happen? It is the last resort. There's two things that will happen. Number one is we may lose our funding. So the whole thing is lost. But also a very technical area, which I just happen to do professionally, is that over the right to buy and to be able to actually get the final orders through, the final demolition orders through, to stop the right to buy on the areas you're involving, we have to have a plan in place. We have to do this. Otherwise, you open up the whole situation all over again. We're back to square one. And anybody can put their right to buy on a property 
was about to be demolished and that we will be having to purchase even more properties back. So in fact, we have no choice over this because the legislation is there. So it's not a question of an, oh, I don't feel like it. It's how can we do this and do this the most sensitively way, sensitive way. And that is precisely what we're doing. We're negotiating, we're talking. We're talking also, we should note that this person is a buy to let landlord. It is his business. It is not him who is living on the property, in the, on the estate. They did, the people who live on the estate, who is their homes, voted for this. We have an opportunity tonight to put their wishes into action. And I hope everybody here will want to put it, the wishes of the residents of the estate into action. Thank you, Councillor Daly. Councillor George, please. Uh, normally, Councillor Daly would have spoken at the end, but um, these substance speakers have indicated they wish as she was speaking. That is why I'm slightly out of order. Councillor George, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I mean, it's really important that, that this goes ahead, quite frankly. Um, you know, we need to build these houses. You know, this this needs to go ahead. Um, people need to see some action now. Um, there was a comment earlier, uh, and we're talking about whether you know RB, RBK is much more trustworthy for residents. I mean, it is, you know, well, we're going to have to put our trust in um, the people that are running the council because um, we need to get this going ahead. But you know, I can see reasons why people might be a bit concerned you know when you do see uh, the residents of Cumberland House um, not getting the same um, you know courtesy um, as other people and plonking nine stories right in their car park and on the children's playground I, I keep mentioning it and I will keep mentioning it but I can see why people are a bit concerned about whether RBK can be trusted unfortunately in this instance this is so important we're going to have to put our trust work trust in, in, in the, the people involved and um, just hope that they sit, do, do us right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor George. Councillor Rada Mills, please. Very quickly, right to buy was a, a conservative uh, policy to allow people to, to purchase their own home. Uh, it's been much abused by people then selling on to people who then become by to uh, um, uh, the absentee landlords to be held up by one of those with the number of cases of desperate families needing to move into better accommodation I find infinitely distasteful and therefore we do need this to happen. Thank you, Councillor Radamels. And lastly, Councillor Shepherd, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll keep it very brief. I wholeheartedly support this. Uh, we have to act for the residents, not for one business person on the estate. It's critical that this goes ahead, and I really hope that everybody will support it. Thank you. Councillor Kerr, thank you, thank you Councillor Shepherd. Councillor Kerr, could you, could you sum up, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm having to use my microphone tonight. Um, just to say that what is at stake in phase one is 452 new homes. I think that the, the case has been put quite conclusively that one vital example is not to hold that up. There's also a community centre, flexible office space and commercial space. Um, I really agree with Councillor Shepherd that we should all vote for this. The, Landlord is being offered a fair market price. There is no exploitation here. This is simply allowing the regeneration that the, that the residents of that estate have so overwhelmingly said they want. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Can I, um, is there anybody here who wishes this to go to a uh, roll call vote or can we accept the two to see Does Does anybody else wish it to go to a roll call vote? If so, please type your name into the chat function now. Thank you. That is unanimous with one abstention. Thank you, councillors. We now move on. We are getting there. We now move on to item 12, the interim decision-making um, interim decision-making arrangements. 
Um, please note that in addition to the report on the agenda at Appendix D, late material has also been circulated to all members because, of course, we only have the result of the judgment delivered yesterday. Councillor Cobbett, will you confirm if you will be moving the recommendations on the late material, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I will be, yes. Thank you. And Councillor Sweeney, can you confirm that you are the second of those recommendations, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillors. Are there any other members who wish to speak? If so, please type your name into the function. Councillor Davis, please. Are there any other members, please? So, Councillor um, Cobbett, would you please move the recommendations? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it is it is late, uh, but our, uh, and we'll all be glad that we haven't got to travel home after this meeting, which which in a way, uh, in a roundabout way, brings me to the point because uh, next time we have a committee, we will be in the in the Guild Hall, um, and I think um, you know it isn't it isn't a decision of, of of the council. It's not necessarily the decision I, I would have made, uh, as much as I'm keen to see everyone again and to to get out get out of the house. Uh, I, I personally. I think there are some some downsides to this in terms of members who will feel in the period at least uh, up until June 21st where this won't necessarily be in line with what's happening more broadly will not feel comfortable coming in and I think that's regrettable uh, but they're clearly but you know in a way that's academic because you know the legislation to have virtual meetings was a government piece of legislation they've opted not to extend it there's been a legal challenge uh, that challenge has ruled that you know the meetings need to return in person so we've got to prepare for that so th this is really about what we do to prepare for that and try and do that safely um, and enable as much participation as we can with it within the limits that we have. Um, so essentially, you know, we're looking at uh, a range of things that we're going to do uh, to do that. So we're looking primarily here at the period uh, from the 7th of May, or in practical terms, it'd be the 13th of May, because that'll be the first meeting uh, that we have after that, particularly until the 21st of June. We're putting these provisions down as until July Council, but we have to, we will have to be quite agile because actually, if the situation in COVID is much improved, there might be some of the restrictions that are in place around the in-person meetings might be able to be lifted as we go on, and we we've, we've built in flexibility so that can be reviewed as we go. But the initial proposal is essentially where a committee that was due to be held in the timetable between the seventh of May and the twenty-first of June. Um, where the business is not critical to be held by then, we will delay it and hold it in late June or in the first part of July, so that we can benefit from uh, the broader the broader relaxation in the government's roadmap on COVID. Uh, annual council um, will essentially do two things: we'll separate out the mayor making from annual council. So the mayor making would take place earlier in the day on the 18th of May as an outdoor event uh, to allow at least some. Uh, of the dignitaries that attend and friends and family of the incoming and outgoing mayor to, to attend. Uh, it will be capped, but you can have 30 outdoors and uh, you know allow some ability to do that. And then the annual council meeting itself will just be held with chorusy only with 12 members. Uh, but you won't be missing much if you're not there because outside of the mayor making, it really is just confirming committee appointments and, and process items to be a very short meeting. And then the licensing meeting that has to take place immediately after annual council will do. But again, it's a quorum only basis. It, all it really does is allow the, sub, the licensing subcommittees to then happen uh, through the year. So it needs to happen for that reason. Um, then we'll also look at neighbourhood committees happening in, in, in the Guild Hall, which is not ideal, but it means that we can broadcast them. Uh, because you know, if you've got a limited public gallery, it's important that you can live broadcast the meetings. Uh, we will uh, for the bigger meetings. Uh, we will look, which is essentially planning committee and council. We're looking at external venues. We're talking to a couple of external venues at the moment that would allow be bigger, allow more social distancing. But the other meetings would be held in the Guild Hall. Essentially, that it would be the Queen Anne Street and the Guild Hall put together. That would allow for a capacity of twenty nine. Uh, so officers would come in for for items on a one in one out basis, and then the members would be there at one and a half meter social distance with perspex screens. There'd be obviously requirements around masks and ventilation and so on. I haven't got time to cover all the detail, and that would allow us to have a, a public gallery of nine members. So we'd make it as normal as we possibly can. So it's just really a, a, an effort to meet the situation where we are we are trying and find a way that would at least make most members feel that they could come in and that the public and members who do come in will feel as safe as they can in the circumstances responding to the judgment thanks uh, councillor davis please 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it is, of course, uh, a difficult situation that we're finding ourselves in. Um, obviously, uh, uh, the, the, the government is a very busy place at the moment, and there's an awful lot of business that needs to go through the, the both Houses of Parliament, and clearly the needs of council meetings is probably quite a low priority. Um, and uh, it, it is, of course, noted that the department was well, it was supporting is the wrong word, I think, probably legally, but it was supportive of the challenge in the High Court to try and give us the option of trying to move this on, and that wasn't, as, as we know, successful. Um, I don't know, and I don't know if any if, if Councillor Cobbett can tell us, there was a further question being asked, or the courts asked the plaintiff to ask a further question, which was to do with public participation and, and whether we need to make uh, provide provision for that. I don't know whether that question is being asked, but it's obviously something we need to consider. Um, one thing I would say, though, is, and I've made this comment privately to officers when they came to me about this revised issue around uh, annual council and things, is that we, we have known this deadline was coming. I mean, it's not exactly um, new to us. Um, and in fact, one of the suggestions I did make at the time I was approached was that we, instead of delaying the, the actual council meeting as we did by 10 days or waiting hopefully a judgment, which we didn't come out the way we wanted anyway, and actually just ended up with papers that were either or, um, we could of course add annual council tonight. There's no reason why we couldn't have done that. And that would have at least kicked off the year uh, in a virtual way. And, and in fact, one of the worries I have about this is, is this is not a very innovative approach that Kingston is adopting. I mean, obviously, I'm in contact with many leaders up and down the, co the country in different authorities trying many, many different things. But one option we could have had is this continue with all the virtual committees we currently have and then do what this council has done before, because we've done something similar before. Um, when we switched originally to the executive model, which is you have a very small ratification committee, which is proportionate to the minimum number. And all the committees meet virtually, um, and all they do is move motions that are minded to support. So they don't take the final decision, that's taken by the small ratification committee, which we'd set up and establish on proportional lines. Um, and that could probably be four members who could meet on a fortnightly basis to just ratify all the decisions that could have been made by the virtual committees. But you've chosen not to do that, and so that puts us all in a bit of a difficult position. Um, we're not going to vote against this or anything, because that would be kind of pointless. We just have to get on with it and try and make the best of what's being proposed. But I do worry that, yet again, we're cancelling meetings and avoiding scrutiny and pushing off decisions to some other time, um, because we haven't really thought this through properly. Thank you, Councillor Davis. And um, Councillor Sumner, please. And I, I would have, I've already said to officers that I would have supported a hybrid model where those that won't wish to come into the council and feel comfortable doing that would, and, and those that perhaps either were um, for reasons of vulnerability or they've not had vaccine or haven't been vaccinated yet could have participated virtually. But that wasn't that was taken away from us. Um, my comment really is for the monitoring officer, and I do hope Lauren is, is online. Um, what's been proposed for annual council? I'd like to check the legality of it, because according to the Local Government Act, I don't think what's been proposed is legal in, in preventing the members from coming into the council. And so at the moment, you're proposing having a meeting of full council, but I'm not allowed to attend. And so I'm as an opposition councillor and not allowed to vote on, on, on what you propose in terms of, of your committees. Um, and I just want to, to get some confirmation as to is that legal in terms of the Local Government Act? Because my understanding is that it isn't. Um, and so I'd like some clarification on that point, please, from, from Lauren. Um, and I would, we know it's very difficult. I know everyone's doing their best to work around. But I think tonight has proven that Democracy isn't best served online. If we have a look at the feedback problems we've had, people dropping in and out, councillor shape being cut off halfway through a speech and then jumping in and interrupting what I was saying, and then it isn't served best by online. And I think we do need to find a way for full, for scrutiny of our decisions to, well, your decisions, to um, to be allowed. And, and it's not, It's I, I, think it, I think what's happened, because we've started off from a high bar, our council, 
was originally before this we had before before we made all the constitutional changes we, we had a council that was very embracive and allowed for a lot of participant uh, present participation and scrutiny and now it's gone backwards and backwards and, and i really want to push to get more scrutiny in in a way that is safe and so and could could the monitor officer please confirm to me what whether what is being proposed is legal and if i can actually be prevented from attending council I'm just going to ask Mr. Marsden to comment on what you just said. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you, you will appreciate, um, members, that, that um, these, these are not ideal circumstances. This is not where we would want to be at this stage. Um, we are faced with a situation where there is a limited capacity within the council chamber in order to, um, in order to accommodate social distancing requirements. Um, that capacity is considerably less than the number of members of the council, so therefore it would not be lawful um, under the present circumstances for us to accommodate all 48 members of the council within the council chamber. So we have to take account of our legal responsibilities in that respect. The proposal has been put forward that attendance be on a quorum-only basis. Um, if a member, another member attends that meeting, they will not be physically removed from it um, and they may exercise their right to attend provided we do not exceed the maximum capacity which is allowed within the chamber um, and obviously we need to take account not just of council members who are attending the meeting but also um, officers that need to be present to support the meeting and um, in addition members of the public because we do need to make allowance for a public gallery to be present as well. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Councillor Sweeney, do you wish to add anything? Please. No, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Kerr, uh, you wish to add anything? Um, I wasn't going to speak, but I just felt uh, perhaps I needed to take on um, Councillor. Councillor Davis is somehow blaming us for the situation that we're in. I'd just like to remind everyone that the High Court said this was, a this was a decision for Parliament, not the courts. And those choices were made legislatively, both in Scotland and in Wales, and only the Westminster government failed to make provision for virtual meetings. This is a ridiculous situation. MPs are allowed to participate remotely until the 21st of June. Councils are not. We're left with the financial challenge of sourcing bigger venues some of our meetings where we're left with a discriminatory situation where some councillors will be unable to attend meetings because of health anxieties and the loss to our democratic process of greater public participation. Many residents have told us that they found it easier to join meetings when it didn't entail a trip to the Guild Hall. But sadly, neither the needs of residents or the workability of local government seems to count for very much with this Conservative administration. But please don't blame us. On a point of order, Madam, Madam Mayor, I didn't blame the administration for the legal position we're finding in. I'm blaming them for the lack of ideas they've had about how to overcome it. But local government's about being innovative and entrepreneurial, and this has just chosen to be a, a council that sort of sticks its fingers in its ears and listens to no one. Thank you. Can we, can we, can we restrict our comments to actually what's on the papers in front of us? Because it's now half past 11. This is an interesting debate. But we need to move on with the vote, I think. Do we need so, excuse me, Madam Mayor, sorry to interrupt, but my question hadn't been answered. So in the Local Government Act, I have every council has a legal right to attend a court council meeting and vote. So it wasn't really answered. So when can I expect a full answer, please, Madam Mayor? Could you please listen? I think it's best if you contact our monitoring officer after the meeting for written clarification and confirmation of its legality. Thank you. Um, but do you wish to sum up, please? Uh, yes, thanks, Madam. I wasn't going to because of the hour, but I'd better respond to a couple of the things that have been raised. Um, and okay. Councillor Francisco Sam has talked about annual council. And I, you know, I understand the concern there. And it, it, you know, if it was any kind of regular decision making committee, I wouldn't I wouldn't propose to operate it on a core core only basis. Whereas, whereas the annual council, all it all it does is sort of ratify appointments for the year, and then the meeting will be over. And if we if we were to accommodate it, we would be, have to pay for a bigger venue to march us all down there at sort of cost to the public purse to do that. I don't think you know that would really be justifiable to the public. However, if she's really keen to be there, 
he's very welcome to have my place. I'm not particularly desperate to take the bus into Kingston, ratify some committee appointments, and then go home again. So if he really wants to be that, very, very welcome to, to be one of the 12, and we can we can arrange that. Um, in terms of uh, the, the points that uh, Councillor Davis made, uh, raised, I mean, there are, there are all kinds of di all different kinds of ways that councillors have, have cut the cake on this. I know some have looked at having, you know, virtual meetings to sort of make the recommend recommended decisions and then the officers sign the decisions off, but we were sort of worried about uh, some of the risks associated with that. Um, I take the point about, you know, the ratification committee would have been one way of doing it. Uh, you know, there are certainly worse ways of doing it than, 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 than they're being proposed here. Some councils are not going to have the meetings at all or are going to delegate decisions to officers. I certainly don't think we should be doing that. And we will have all the meetings in this cycle. We will just have some of them slightly later than they, than they would have been. It isn't a perfect solution uh, but it's not a perfect situation and you know the, the 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 democratic services team have been working on this and public health and health and safety and all others feeding into it and we were in a situation where we didn't know until this week you know whether we were planning for this scenario or, or another one we're actually planning for both scenarios it you know it will it will get us to it will get us to the next stage in the process and i hope by the time we get to july council a lot of this won't matter because things will be more normal anyway uh, but this it will give us a way of having of having the meetings we need to have and making the decisions that we need to make. So I encourage people to, to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cobbett. Do we need to go to a uh, roll call vote on this, please, councillors? Um, if any member wishes to go to a roll call vote, please type the name in the chat now. So can we assume that this, um, can we assume that these recommendations are agreed unanimously then, please? If you disagree, please type your name in the chat function. Thank you, that is carried unanimously. So that recommendation is carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. We now move on to num uh, item number 13, the election of the mayor for 2021 20, to 22. At the extraordinary meeting of council in May 2020, it's noted that this meeting will be asked to elect councillor Sashila Abraham. Councillor Green, will you therefore confirm if you will be moving the election of councillor Abraham as mayor for the 21 to 22 municipal year? I'm very happy to confirm that I'm proposing uh, Councillor Shishila Abraham to be mayor. And since we won't all be together, I thought I should do my speech now. Um, I'm only joking. I'm not really going to. Um, Shishila, all you need to know is Shishila will be a fantastic mayor for next year. Thank you, Councillor Green. Um, you disappoint me. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Shaver, will you be seconder, please? Yes, I'd be delighted to be seconder for uh, Sir Sheila as our mayor. Thank for, you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, are there any other members that wish to speak on this, please? No, thank you. Anybody else wish to add anything? Thank you. So, um, can we assume that this is carried unanimously, please? There are no uh, objections. Thank you. So I would like to be the uh, very first person to congratulate Councillor Sashila Abraham as Mayor of the Royal Borough of Kingston for the years 2021 to 2022. So thank you, Sashila. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to... Uh, to item 14, which was the election of the TIP staff. Um, Mr. Michael Siegel um, has agreed to be nominated as the honorary TIP staff in town crime for the Royal Borough. Um, Councillor Parrish, will you confirm that you are moving this recommendation, please? Yes, I would like to confirm to move the recommendation. Thank you. And Councillor Kerr, will you be the seconder for this, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there <laughs> I would like to say some words, uh, Councillor Davis, please, in moving this. Okay, Councillor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, um, I think uh, Michael Siegel has done a really uh, great job, and I'm pleased that he wants to continue for three more years in the office. And I'm highly recommend that we all agree on this. And I just want again to highlight. Uh, how grateful I am for the job he has done. I think he has done and exercised his duty to this borough with diligence, dignity and decorum. And I'm really delighted 
to uh, yeah, recommend him for another three years. Thank you, Councillor Kirsch. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, is there anybody who disagrees or wishes to speak on this? No, thank you. So that is carried unanimously. That Mr. Mike Siegel will be our tip staff and town crier for the next three years. Thank you. Appointment. Uh, item 15 is the appointment of members to committees, panels and other bodies. Um, Appendix E refers to shareholder committee, um, which was formerly the finance and Courts, I can't remember how writing it. The shareholder committee reports to the finance and partnerships um, committee. So, to clarify, following the decision of the council tonight to change the strategic committees, it is now called the corporate and responses and resources committee. So, Councillor Cobbett, will you confirm that you are moving the recommendations on page six, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I will be. Thank you. And Councillor Kirsch, are you the second of these recommendations, please? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. Is there any member who wishes to speak on this item? If so, will you please type your name to the chat function now? Thank you. Um, so nobody wishes to speak. So can we then um, assume that this is carried unanimously? No deep abstain, so nobody wishes to go to a roll call vote. Thank you very much indeed, that is carried. Item 16 is the Armed Forces Community Covenant. This is a brief update on the work of the Armed Forces Community Covenant Working Group pending submission of a fuller report later. This is for information only. Do any members wish to speak on it? No. Thank you. I would just like to thank Councillor Netley, who has worked with me on the Armed Forces Community Covenant for the last two years, and um, you will see the results of our work in that report. So thank you, Councillor Netley. Thank you. So after this, what I'm going to describe is a test of endurance by all of us from this meeting, and I sincerely hope this is the last full council meeting we have to have online. Um, there are no other items authorised by me and there is no exempt business, so I close this meeting at 11.41. Um, as it's the last full business meeting of the Council this municipal year, I would really like to thank members and officers for all their hard work with the Council, as I said earlier during this late year. As I said before, it's been a tough year and I think we have achieved a great deal together, so thank you everybody. Um, the live stream in this meeting